Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Tony McDonough. I'm a, a legal director in the shipping team here in London with a particular interest in ports, uh, shipping, personal injury and general average. Uh, and I shall be chairing today's webinar. Um, we're absolutely delighted to be putting on this webinar today and to have such a stellar lineup of guests for you, all of whom are extremely busy at the moment with all things Brexit. So we are very, very grateful to them for giving up their time to talk to you today. So we're almost there. The real Brexit after the uh, transition period is upon us and the old division of leavers and remainers has gone. And as business people, we have to get to grips with the realities of the new trading relationship and to ensure it works to the advantage of all of us. Our guests today are representatives of their trade bodies and rightly can be expected to fly the flag for their respective associations to push for their members' interests and to both spot problems, but also to talk up their sector and look for opportunities going forward. The job of a lawyer is a bit different. Historically, we were presented with problems after the event and would endeavour to resolve the problem in our client's best interests. That situation has changed in recent years and increasingly lawyers are being proactive, getting closer to their clients' commercial operations and are effectively in the business of loss prevention. And that's what the lawyers section of today's talks will be focusing on. <clears throat> so please don't think that the title of this webinar and our constant search for potential problems is a sign of a negative outlook. The intention is to spot problems and by doing so avoid them. Our intention also is to run a follow up webinar in the new year once the dust has settled a bit on the new trading relationship and we can review the position and see what worked well and what did not. And who knows, it might even be possible to have an old fashioned seminar and a webinar. We've split today's webinar into three sections, the shipping perspective, the port perspective and the haulier logistics perspective. In each of them, the speakers will be representing the interest of that sector. So if we say something that you consider as potentially prejudicial to your sector's interests, please bear in mind that at some point this afternoon, we will be talking from your perspective. And again, our intention today is to encourage parts of the trade chain to speak to one another and to iron out these issues before they become problems. And always remember that Hill Dickinson, like the Ritz Hotel, is open to all, and you have merely to instruct us first to have us on your side. Um, some housekeeping. Um, please, can you make sure that your microphones are muted? That will help with the uh, presentation. Please turn off the cameras to help with the bandwidth. As I said, each section, we well, have three sections, each will be roughly 30 minutes long with some talking around it, questions around it. Questions should be submitted via the chat box. If you wish to address the question to a particular speaker, please identify the speaker and I will put it to them. I will be asking the questions. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. Um, I won't identify the questioner, so anonymity will be ensured. The, the presentation today will be recorded, uh, but as I say, uh, for GDPR purposes, anonymity is ensured. If we don't get around to your question today, then we will respond to you via email as soon as possible. So we hope that this is a, a, a fruitful experience for all of us. We hope it's interactive. And without further ado, um, I will introduce our first guest speaker, who is Bob Sanguinetti of the UK Chamber of Shipping. Um, Bob is the Chief Executive of the UK Chamber of Shipping, a graduate of Oxford University. Bob served in the Royal Navy for almost three decades, rising to the rank of Commodore. He commanded several Royal Navy warships and a multinational coalition task force before working at the Ministry of Defence in a number of strategic roles. He assumed the role of CEO at the Gibraltar Port Authority in May 2014. Bob was appointed Chief Executive Officer of the UK Chamber in July 2018. His role includes responsibility for the UK shipping industry's relations with government and other relevant bodies, both national and international, on all matters fiscal, economic, employment, safety, environment, security, and all other issues. So, Bob, over to you. Thank you. Well, good afternoon, uh, everyone. Uh, it's a real pleasure to, to, to be here today uh, to talk about uh, Brexit and what could possibly go wrong uh, in Brexit, uh, an entirely um, appropriate title, if I may, and the timing again could not be uh, could not be better. With uh, uh, no deal yet in sight, uh, the Prime Minister heading to uh, to Brussels uh, and uncertainty 
uh, reigns uh, large uh, at the moment. Um, as, as Tony said, um, I, I've, uh, I'm CEO of the UK Chamber of Shipping. We represent about 200 member companies, um, about half of whom are uh, ship owners or ship managers, uh, and the other half uh, provide uh, maritime uh, related uh, services. So we've got quite a lot of breadth um, and within those ship owners and, and ship managers, we represent the, the large energy majors, the cruise companies, the ferry companies who are particularly uh, interested in the outcome of Brexit, um, uh, other wet and dry cargo carriers, uh, and all the way through um, offshore specialist vessels, again, who will have an interest in, uh, in Brexit, um, and, and tug operators and everything in between. Um, before uh, I joined the chamber, uh, I, I was in Gibraltar, as, as Tony said, so I've lived through the Brexit experience from 2016 onwards. Uh, when I was running the port of Gibraltar, I also did some contingency planning on behalf of the government and the chief minister of uh, Gibraltar on Brexit. Uh, and uh, of relevance was the fact that uh, Gibraltar uh, has uh, never been in the customs union of the uh, EU. Uh, Gibraltar uh, does have a land border with the EU. Uh, so it's not just uh, Northern Ireland, but uh, but Gibraltar does that as well. So so I've got some experience of the sorts of issues uh, that we're grappling with at the moment and the sorts of issues that will no doubt will uh, keep us busy over the coming weeks and months as we go beyond the expiry of the uh, transition period. Um, moving on to my, my first slide, um, since the start of the process, uh, what you see on, on the slide uh, are the three priorities uh, that the Chamber has stuck to uh, throughout uh, the process. In terms of um, uh, frictionless trade, uh, we have argued all along uh, on an apolitical basis. Uh, we have not taken sides uh, with political parties uh, nor expressed a preference uh, for particular um, uh, trade um, or agreement proposals. Uh, what we simply have uh, argued for and campaigned for is frictionless trade. Thank you. Right, so, so uh, the, the first bullet there, frictionless trade, um, is what we're after. Um, whether it's whether there's a deal at the end of the day or or no deal, um, trading or continuing to trade uh, with our biggest trading partner, uh, the EU bloc, is something that uh, we would wish to see happen with minimum um, resistance, minimum friction uh, at the points of uh, entry and uh, exit. Um, the second one, uh, this is about people, uh, always extremely important, and whether it's um, um, seafarers or those who will uh, go uh, ashore and continue uh, delivering in the maritime space, uh, we wish to be able to uh, retain access to the best people from across the EU and ind in indeed beyond so that we can continue to um, consolidate the UK's position as a key maritime hub. And uh, the third bullet is on policy. Um, again, uh, we, we hear lots about um, regaining sovereignty and regaining control of our own laws and so on. Um, if and when we uh, see ourselves uh, unshackled from some of the bureaucracy of Brussels, uh, we would like to be in a position to influence uh, policies, UK policy going forward, uh, to make sure that the UK uh, is uh, at, at the very least equal to its partners and certainly not disadvantaged when it comes to uh, striking deals and doing business uh, across the uh, English, um, uh, across the Channel and the North Sea and indeed the Irish Sea uh, with our European um, partners. Um, next slide, please. So to what extent do we think um, that we're going to witness frictionless trade uh, after the 1st of January? Um, I, I would say pragmatically from a shipping perspective, uh, in the early days, uh, there will be um, some disruption uh, to trade. There will be some delay, uh, regardless, and this is a point that I think is lost on many, regardless of whether there is a trade or not. Um, the, the reality is that um, new um, customs checks, new procedures, new systems uh, are being introduced, regardless of whether we have a trade deal or not. Uh, clearly the difference is in tariffs, uh, but either way uh, there will be extra things that need to be done uh, at the points of departure and arrival, which at the moment are not uh, being done. So we can expect there to be uh, delays. I would say in the short term um, this will be 
uh, minor and we would like to see pragmatism applied um, by those enforcing the regulations on both sides of the, uh, the, the borders. Um, moving on to the third point, I won't say too much on this one because I'm sure Richard Ballantyne uh, will cover it in, in a lot more detail and much more accurately than, uh, than I can, uh, but clearly there are challenges here, uh, whether it's to do with physical infrastructure, with IT, with people, uh, and looking at some specialist areas, for example, uh, live animals and food products, uh, where at the moment we might not have the infrastructure or the facilities in place where they need to be. Um, looking further afield, uh, clearly the EU is not the only trading bloc that we do business with. Uh, we have a global outlook and that's been reinforced by government policy uh, over recent months. Uh, there will be new trade deals. Uh, there will be um, more shipping routes, uh, I suspect, to service those deals. But we see that happening uh, in, a, in a slow burn way. I don't think we'll see anything particularly dramatic in the short term. So uh, summing up on, uh, on frictionless trade, uh, I would say that shipping will continue to deliver. Shipping is uh, flexible and will adapt. There may well be a tweak to some of the shipping routes uh, as um, freight companies, as businesses realize that it might be a slightly different way of transporting uh, their goods across uh, between the EU and the UK. Uh, but I don't see this being dramatic and there will be some disruption uh, some friction early on uh, as we get used to the new systems and the new procedures uh, in place. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, looking at people and the first bullet there, uh, what do we mean by this? Uh, looking in particular at uh, seafarers, um, our government, the UK government, has made it very clear that uh, EU seafarers will have their um, the qualifications recognised by UK authorities uh, as they serve and continue to serve on UK flagged ships. Uh, we clearly would like to see uh, the same arrangements for UK seafarers on EU flagged ships. And whilst we've had uh, discussions on a bilateral basis uh, with EU members uh, and we get assurance that uh, that will not change so that uh, UK seafarers will continue to enjoy the same uh, rights, the same privileges and the same access, uh, we have not seen that yet formalised uh, by the EU and it may well be uh, a part of the, uh, the the deal, albeit at a lower level than the strategic piece that's being discussed at the moment. Uh, I think it's fair to say that uh, uh, in UK seafarers, uh, UK cadets, UK officers, uh, we have a really um, highly valued commodity um, and they are in demand um, abroad. Uh, we would like to be able to continue uh, delivering to that um, as we go into 2021 and beyond. Um, on the second point, uh, what I would say here is that uh, taking back control of our borders uh, should not necessarily lead to restrictive rules uh, for, for crews, uh, and in particular for, for crews uh, serving on board UK ships within the UK uh, for short periods, uh, because if we impose those restrictions, clearly uh, we could expect uh, other countries to do likewise in retaliation and it'll cut off uh, some markets where uh, our people, the UK uh, seafarers, mm -hmm. will continue, will wish to continue serving. Um, I, th there are obviously in the short term, um, uh, there'll be um, a bit more clarity on visa requirements, I would like to think, um, and um, we will still see some fluidity uh, of people crossing borders um, on a temporary basis to take up um, their uh, uh, take up their jobs. Uh, so there may well be some disruption in the short term. We might see in the longer term, and this brings me on to the third point, we may see perhaps a little bit of a dilution there uh, and an opportunity for uh, more openings for UK seafarers in uh, UK um, flag vessels and in UK uh, related uh, jobs in the UK. If that is the case, and I don't for a minute believe that that's going to be a seismic shift, but if that is the case, clearly we, we would want to see that as part of a government-wide policy on uh, the UK seafaring community and how that feeds into uh, the Maritime 2050, the government vision for the next 30 years uh, of um, the throughput of people through uh, the UK shipping and wider maritime sectors. Um, moving on to the next slide, please. And looking at uh, policy, perhaps the most uh, uh, the most contentious one, which uh, features 
as one of the stumbling blocks. Now into three sections. The, the chief executive officer of the UK chamber um, uh, that, that seems to be holding back the uh, the deal. Um, much has been said about the uh, level playing field. Um, we would like to think that um, uh, as we uh, perhaps gain a little bit of freedom in the way that we interpret EU regulations, if that still applies uh, as part of a trade deal or in the absence of, uh, of that influence, should we not have a trade deal uh, that we can then look at how to maximise opportunities uh, through the likes of state aid, through tonnage tax and so on, uh, to make the UK more attractive to shipping related business. Um, we have seen um, some effect already uh, that, that, that this is having uh, on shipping and uh, the, the UK flag in particular, where uh, a, a considerable number of UK flagged uh, vessels uh, have re-registered into the EU uh, because simply because the finance agreement uh, requires uh, a certain percentage of tonnage in the EU. And clearly, as we, uh, as we leave the EU, uh, the UK will no longer qualify uh, for that benefit. So we need to find somehow a way of addressing those negative points and increasing the attractiveness of the UK. Will we see a rise in protectionism? Uh, I, I think officially the answer is no, but in reality uh, we're already seeing uh, some signs of, of that taking place. Um, we're quite confident that um, for the time being there's a maritime chapter uh, in uh, the free trade agreement uh, uh, that's been discussed, but of course this might not uh, be signed at the end of the day, uh, which which allows open access to uh, shipping and port services. Um, but at the national level, will we see uh, the same? Uh, uh, will we see that uh, applied uh, consistently and fairly? Um, we don't know. Uh, we we wait and see. Um, I think there will be challenges in competing for for contracts where perhaps uh, e the EU flag is needed. And an area that I would um, mention in this context is the offshore sector. And there's a lot of activity in the offshore sector in the North Sea. Um, I, I, think, I think we will have to wait and see uh, for clarity to emerge uh, and see how the competition rules play out over the coming uh, weeks and months. So we, we need to make sure that we're able to uh, the negative impact that we've already felt and think uh, we're likely to see more of uh, to make um, the UK more attractive. And that takes me to the third point uh, as part of the UK's vision uh, to make sure uh, that the, the UK retains its position as a leading maritime nation, uh, not just for shipping, but for the wider uh, shipping and maritime related services. And on the last point there, a huge amount of talk about climate change, rightly so. Shipping plays a fundamental part in that and takes it very, very seriously. Uh, we've heard announcements recently from the Prime Minister talking about a green industrial revolution. Uh, we've got the Clean Maritime Plan. We've got net uh, in the maritime context. We're clearly a part of the international uh, community uh, and we've got the IMO targets for 2050. But I think looking specifically at the UK in terms of developing the technology, in terms of uh, making sure uh, that we play a prominent part in renewables, offshore renewables, uh, we need to make sure uh, that uh, the policy underpinning that uh, gives us an advantage when it comes to bidding for work in what is uh, an ever expanding uh, domain. So um, plenty of work to be done there in conjunction with uh, with government to make sure uh, that we retain um, the advantage. I think that's all I'll, that, that's, that, that's all I've got by way of slides. So uh, back to you, Tony. Thank you very much for listening. Well, thank you, uh, Bob. And uh, I'd just like to say that, that of course, our rehearsed uh, glitch to demonstrate what could go wrong with Brexit worked very well. So um, I hope everybody spotted the deliberate mistake there. Um, the next section will be, or I should add, and I'm not sure I did at the top of the, the program, we're going to keep the Q&A session to the end. So rather than break up the talk today, uh, with one exception, we're going to keep the questions to the end. So um, if you Remember, do send those questions in on the chat um, and we have a, a number of pre-submitted questions to deal with. Um, now we're moving on to talks by my colleagues Beth Bradley and Rosie Goncare um, on the sort of more legal uh, implications for shipping. Um, <clears throat> Beth is a partner in the shipping team 
and specializes in dispute resolution with particular ex expertise in shipping, shipbuilding, offshore and commodities disputes. Rosie is a senior associate in our shipping team. Rosie advises in relation to various bills of lading and charter party claims, marine insurance, arrests and port work. So uh, over to you, I believe it's Beth first. Thanks very much, Tony. I will try and take control um, of the slides and hopefully they won't. Uh, oh, it is working. Right. Um, I'm going to spend the next 10 minutes talking about force majeure and um, frustration, both of which are defences, uh, which are quite frequently referred to um, where there are kind of big ruptures and particularly uh, large or, or concerns around large delays um, in the in the physical uh, shipment of goods. Now, Rosie and I will both be focusing on the, the implications of Brexit for um, time and voyage charters, uh, because those are the types of contracts that we normally deal with. Um, now, I don't want to be a doomster or a gloomster about how uh, things will work in terms of importing and, and exporting goods from the UK uh, from the 1st of January. But it was notable this morning that uh, amongst the headlines uh, were reports of severe congestion at, at, at a number of the main UK um, ports uh, in the country. And the the problem with congestion and reports of congestion is that quite often somewhere in the supply chain or somewhere along the contractual chain, a party will open the Pandora's box uh, of force majeure and start making declarations of force majeure in order to excuse uh, uh, the delay or their performance as a result of delay. Um, force majeure was a topic which was very widely discussed at the beginning of the coronavirus pandemic back in February and March, where uh, what has now become a more familiar term, lockdowns were being introduced uh, in parts of China, which was placing, or which lockdowns were placing considerable um, difficulties with moving goods in and out of China. And force majeure was something that a lot of people got very excited about and tried to uh, excuse their inability to perform their shipping contracts and, uh, and also their sales contracts uh, because of the delays being in, caused by localised lockdowns and difficulties uh, in ports and resulting congestion. So I think it's worth in the context of Brexit and the, the reported congestion at some of our UK ports, focusing first on force majeure uh, and just really a reminder of what force majeure is and importantly what it isn't and why it is not uh, by any means a panacea uh, or, or, or a defence to problems uh, that are given rise to by congestion. The first and probably most important point to make about English law and contracts governed by English law is that force majeure is not a standalone doctrine. There are some countries which do have their own independent doctrine of, of force majeure, but English law is not one of them. So if you have an English law contract and want to rely on force majeure before you even start declaring force majeure, check to see whether you have a provision uh, ideally headed force majeure. Um, uh, which will enable you contractually to start to work out whether you are able to make a declaration of force majeure in order to excuse uh, your inability to perform. In very general terms, a force majeure clause will list specific events which give rise to the ability to excuse your performance. It's an agreement between the parties that in certain circumstances, performance is relieved. Um, the types of events which are, are, are listed tend to be kind of physical events, so acts of God, hurricanes, um, storms, fire. Uh, we'll also list things like acts of war. What it almost never lists is congestion. Congestion is a follow on event or, or is a consequence of, of one of the specified events. One of the interesting questions I think uh, were force majeure declarations to become a feature over the next couple of months is whether Brexit itself would fall within um, a force majeure clause and in particular the one that it would seem most like is where you have an event listed as, uh, as an act of state or an act of government. Now put very simply the departure from a political union uh, 
probably is an act of government, but whether the English courts would be uh, prepared to widen the existing definitions or the case law that deals with what an act of government means and when you can rely on it as a force majeure or not to Brexit remains to be seen. It's not something which has been done before. So it, it may not be that straightforward to identify an event which permits force majeure, even if you have a, a contractual clause enabling you to declare force majeure in certain circumstances. The events which are listed are very narrowly defined because the uh, effect of a force majeure uh, is to relieve a party of its obligation uh, to perform their contract. So as a matter of English law and, and as an approach to construction which has been adopted by the English courts through the common law is that they will construe this type of clause very narrowly. So you have to have an event and, and the facts behind or the facts that you are relying on must come within the, the definition of the event which is listed in your force majeure clause. Some force majeure clauses widen out the potential events by uh, inserting some generic catch-all word in a familiar amendment is to include uh, a, a, a whatsoever type term. Um, in some contracts, the insertion of the word whatsoever or any other cause beyond the control of the parties uh, may be sufficient to open up the categories of events which you can kind of hang your coat on uh, in order to declare or, or make a valid declaration of force majeure. In maritime contracts, uh, a whatsoever kind of amendment tends to be again narrowly construed so it has to be a, a, an event of the type which uh, exists in the listed events so you've got your specific events and then a whatsoever so it's got to be of the same nature again whether that would work uh, in, in terms of Brexit uh, remains to be seen. The second point really uh, to note is the um, importance of linking the uh, particular event to the inability to perform. So there needs to be a causal link. Now, the news reports this morning of congestion in the UK ports identified, I think I got up to six different reasons uh, for why there is congestion. And I'll just quickly summarise the reasons that have been given. First, seasonal congestion. This is a busy time of year for all the UK ports. We're just coming into the Christmas period and a lot of goods are being imported in order to fulfil consumer demand. So there would always be some level of congestion anyway seasonal congestion. Secondly, COVID-19. It's caused all sorts of disruption for all sorts of different reasons. But in terms of imports into the UK, um, this time last year, there was no huge requirement for PPE equipment. There is now as a result of COVID-19. With the likely uh, import and an increased import, again, something that wasn't needed last year, of new vaccinations, particularly the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccination, that's more stuff physically needed to be moved into the country. Another effect of COVID-19 has been container box shortages. At the beginning of the pandemic, the shortage was caused by port delays and closures in China, where a lot of containers were left on board vessels, unable to be discharged quickly and with the usual turnarounds. Stability has returned to a certain extent since February and March, but there is still a, a box shortage. And rather than China being the focus of the box shortage, as it was towards the beginning of this year, the UK may in turn be a, a, a contributing factor to the box shortage where there is congestion and goods simply aren't able to be turned around quickly enough. COVID-19 also is, is likely to cause staff shortages um, at ports, both in terms of um, creating a safe COVID safe working environment, there will be fewer people uh, able to work at the same time, but also people going in and out of self-isolation um, and possibly being infected by illness, not just COVID-19, but also another seasonal illness such as flu or colds. So a whole host of problems there which could be causative of the particular delay or the congestion. And then finally, one of the reasons given was Brexit itself, where it is said that some businesses ahead of the 1st of January, where they don't know what's likely, what 
what may or may not happen, depending on whether there's a deal or not, or what that deal will be, are increasing their requirements for imports into the country ahead of any duty changes or tariff changes. So a whole bunch of different causes. This does not make it easy to identify whether you have an event which is causative of the particular uh, obligation that you are trying to seek relief in relation to performance um, of and, and identifying the, the, the event that you need to identify to make sure you've got a, a force majeure claim. Um, this need to make the causal link um, is, is very difficult, uh, it, it's very factually sensitive um, and also as the party relying on it carries the burden of proof, it is up to you if you're declaring force majeure to try and make sure that your ducks in all, are in order um, before you make that declaration. The next point to note is foreseeability. Now, classically, force majeure is, is considered to be an event which is uh, outside the foreseeability of the parties to the contract at the time that they enter into that contract. So an act of God or an act of war um, falls within that foreseeability issue. Most contracts you wouldn't at the beginning necessarily foresee that a war will be declared, for example. Brexit may not be quite so straightforward since we've had a four year lead time um, uh, between the, the outcome of the, the referendum result in the UK and uh, the upcoming end to the transition period. So foreseeability could be an issue. And some contracts and uh, some force majeure clauses it's themselves make foreseeability or the unforeseeability of an event uh, a specific requirement. So you may not be able to re rely, even if you've got through the first few hoops um, on it for Brexit, if, if it could be argued that it these event or, or the congestion, for example, uh, was foreseeable at the time you entered your contract. Moving on, um, another uh, issue that was particularly uh, cropped up uh, where parties were seeking to declare force majeure at the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic was a, a, a tendency to declare uh, termination of contracts on the basis of the force majeure clause. Now, whether you can terminate or not is a right that is specifically to be given by the clause. If it's not there, you can't terminate. Uh, if your clause only excuses performance, say for loading, but not for discharging, if your issue is with discharging, you won't be able to rely on the force majeure clause. So it does bear very close and careful reading. Um, my penultimate point on force majeure is the duty to mitigate. So the party who is seeking to rely on force majeure to relieve them of their contractual obligations must take reasonable steps in mitigation and must also document that there is no other alternative to perform their obligations. Again, it's very factually sensitive and it bears uh, some care before uh, send in a force majeure declaration. Um, and the final point to watch out for is that many clauses require notices to be given and we'll also go into some detail about the types of notices and the timing um, in which such a notice is to be given. Notice provisions are very strictly upheld so if there is one and you have to give a, a notice of force majeure within a certain period and if you think that you can do it within the contractually specified time, otherwise you'll lose your right to declare force majeure. You must be careful about the content of the notices and ideally identify um, the particular force majeure event that you are relying on. And if you think it's more than one, set all of those out. Um, and where uh, the notice requires it to be supported by evidence, make sure that some evidence is, is attached to the notice. Um, please bear in mind that force majeure certificates are not really a feature of English um, commercial practice or, or, or governmental practice. So uh, again, uh, at the beginning of the pandemic, I think the Chinese government were offering force majeure certificates. Um, it is not likely that there will be force majeure certificates available in a similar way um, for Brexit uh, from the UK government. OK, so that's all I have to say about force majeure. It is horrendously difficult to succeed on force majeure um, uh, as a defence or, or, or to, to an obligation to perform. Um, so bear it in mind, uh, if you receive a force majeure notice, scrutinise it closely before uh, adopting it down the contractual lane.
So if you think if you are thinking about declaring force majeure, do check the contract clause very carefully and bear in mind the, the points that I've just made. OK. Where force majeure isn't an option, the other place that uh, parties will look to uh, relieve them of their performance obligations is the doctrine of frustration. Like force majeure, it's incredibly difficult to succeed in demonstrating uh, that an event which uh, is frustrating has occurred, which relieves you of your obligation to perform your contract. The threshold to prove pr frustration is very high and the kind of English law um, phrase to describe how high the, 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 the threshold is, is that the, the, the circumstances have changed such that they go to the very root of the contract and renders the performance of the contract radically different to that which was anticipated when the contract was entered into. Frustration does not apply where performance has been uh, rendered less profitable or commercially unviable in any way. So the additional cost does not make um, any real difference. And the map uh, which is illustrating this slide up uh, is there to remind me to, to mention the Suez Canal cases where uh, uh, the kind of doctrine of frustration was developed quite significantly in relation to shipping. And it was found in many of those places that where the Suez Canal had been closed, uh, such that the ships could not go through, um, that it was absolutely fine as far as the courts were concerned for the ship owner to take the vessels all the way around um, uh, in order to discharge their goods where they needed to be. Uh, and the, the closure of the Suez Canal, because there was an alternative method of performance, was not a frustrating event. Um, like force majeure, frustration is a, a question of fact. So you have to, again, examine the factual circumstances as well as consider whether the contractual performance has been radically altered. In terms of time and voyage charters, um, a lengthy delay caused by frustration is unlikely to be a frustrating event um, in and of itself. Um, for time charters, the guidance is it's very exp expandable because it's English law uh, and you, you were looking at quite extraordinarily delays before you even getting into the territory of that delay becoming a, an event which could be said to be frustrating. Voyage charters are a little bit easier, um, but you will be looking at delays of quite a significant length still. Two or three weeks of delay is not an uncommon type of delay for marine contracts. And so a couple of weeks or a few days will not be enough um, to persuade an arbitrator, uh, arbitration tribunal or, or a court uh, that the type of delay being um, experienced is, is, is a frustrating delay. Um, I'm going to pass on now to Rosie, who is going to look uh, more closely at the types of clauses which are available um, and are commonly used in time and voyage charters to allocate the risk of delay between the owner uh, and the charterer. Thank you. Thank you, Beth, and good afternoon to everyone who is listening to our today's presentation. No doubt Brexit, uh, just like COVID-19 outbreak, is an exceptional event. And given the likely delays and disruptions due to Brexit, many logistic business may be adversely affected and in fact may struggle to honor their contractual obligations. A reduced rate of cargo operations may result in longer waiting time, which will have a knock-on effect on shipping and logistic operations. Uh, as Beth has just explained during her presentation, lengthy delay in a port is unlikely to be a frustrating event. Therefore, uh, the standard position is that in a time charter, the charterer agrees to bear the risk and of delay and is obliged to continue to pay higher, higher throughout unless the delay is caused by, an, by another fire event. In a void charterer, the owner is compensated for the void charterer's payment of the mortgage. I will now consider the position with regard to time and voyage charters in more detail and will also discuss what parties have to do to future proof their contracts against uh, Brexit impact. 
So as you can see on, uh, on slide one, we will discuss the position in relation to charter parties, time charter parties. And uh, the following questions can be asked is as to where, if there is an off hire clause uh, in, in your time charter, where is it to be found? In a standard form or in the rider clauses? Does uh, the clause cover that particular event, uh, for example, the delay uh, due to Brexit, and what is the effect of the event? So, therefore, if a question, if we can ask a question, if a vessel is affected by a significant delay due to Brexit, must the charters continue to pay higher? And the answer is yes, is the times charter is bound to pay higher for the use of a vessel unless there are events which might place the vessel of higher. Whether hire is payable will depend on the specific of hire clause and the nature of a delay, which means that the matters will turn on the specific circumstances of the case. Uh, as you can see uh, from the extract of clause uh, 15 of 1946 form, uh, the events are clearly specified in the clause uh, and they end with or by any other cause preventing the full working of a vessel. That's when the payment of a hire shall cease of the time thereby lost. Uh, similar provisions uh, can also be found in clause 17 of NIPE form 1993 uh, and other forms. Therefore, on the basis of unamended clauses, uh, the congestion at port will not usually be an off hire event. Uh, therefore, uh, a common amendments are made to clause 15 uh, to include the word whatsoever after the praise any other cause. And where the clause 15 is amended in this way by the far parties, uh, the permissible events for of higher purposes will be wider and therefore they may include to a port congestions. However, we also need to remember that uh, the, the time charters uh, uh, also require uh, to look at the effect of a relevant event. And clause 15 also contains a second requirement to, to, to say that the event has prevented the full working of the vessel. Most likely the owners will maintain that the vessel is in fact in full working order, although delayed. For example, if a vessel is waiting in a berthing queue along with other vessel, then this is a required service and the full working of the vessel is therefore not being prevented and the vessel is not of hire. So therefore it is a, a fact specific exercise. If a vessel is placed of hire, then there may be a right to the time charter to cancel the charter party if the of hire event continues for more than a certain number of days, um, if such right is of course stated in the applicable uh, clause in your charter party. On the other hand, uh, the owners may also be willing to terminate the charter if, for example, charters fail to pay higher, but the market rates have increased to, in response to the delays and disruptions. Um. Uh, we will now look uh, into position uh, in relation to voyage charters. And in a voyage charter context, it is the LACAN, notice of readiness, lay time and demurrage provisions, including any exceptions, which deal with the running of time and potential, potential interruption of time. These clauses need to be considered very carefully. In general, a vessel can only tender a valid notice of readiness and so to trigger the commencement of lay time when the vessel is arrived and ready at the place uh, defined in the contract. Therefore, we would need to check first if valid notice of readiness can be given if the vessel is unable to reach a berth due to the events outside of the owner's control, such as delays due to Brexit. In the unamended clause uh, 6 on the, of the standard GenCon 1994 form, uh, you, can set the, uh, you can see the following standard provision. If, uh, which I will read as, uh, now, if a loading or discharging berth is not available on the vessel's arrival at or off the port of loading discharging, the vessel shall be entitled to give notice of readiness within ordinary office hours on arrival there whether in free partique or not, whether customs cleared or not. Lay time or time on demurrage shall then count as if she were in birth and in all respects ready for loading, um, discharging, provided 
that the master warrants that she is in fact ready in all respects. Similar provisions are also found in Asbatank Woi form and a Shell Woi form. Therefore, readiness is both physical and documentary in nature, and as such, granting of free critique to the vessel uh, by the port at which um, cargo operations are due to take place is very important. However, if it is later found that the vessel is not ready, time lost after the discovery of a problem until loading, discharging can commence is not to count. In the other famous case, uh, the Delian Spirit, uh, it was also said by the court that if documentary readiness was a mere formality, such that such the master had no reason to, be, to believe that clearances would not be obtained, a notice of readiness tendered before confirmation from the port authorities would still be a valid tender. Uh, as you can see also from the slide, in the amended GenCon uh, 1990 form, uh, there are only very few ex exceptions to the running of LATA, and such, such exceptions are limited to weather permitting, Sunday and holidays, uh, time used in moving from the place of waiting uh, to the loading or discharging berth. So there are, if there are no other further exceptions to demurrage, the demurrage is payable on presentation of uh, owner's invoice. Therefore, in view of the above, uh, it is very likely that the charters will bear the risk and the costs of the delays at the port, and the demurrage will continue to accrue unless the standard clause charter party is expressly amended uh, by the parties. I will now uh, briefly, briefly speak about the delays in deviation with, with regards to uh, bills of lading and potential cargo claims. I think transportation companies and supplies may find themselves unable to deliver goods to the destinations in the UK. Also, uh, commercial losses may be incurred due to delays in discharge ports in the UK and transshipment costs can be incurred. Furthermore, significant delays increases businesses' exposure to claims for loss in the financial value of the cargo and also for cargo damage, in particular where the cargo is perishable such as food, food products. Therefore, uh, uh, if the cargo should be discharged in a UK port, but there are significant delays at the particular discharge port, deviation to other UK ports may be considered. However, it is uh, very important to know that uh, at common law, the vessel is entitled to deviate only if there is a, a risk to maritime adventure. Uh, although time charters will often contain clauses giving liberty to deviate, um, it means not to proceed with utmost dispatch or due dispatch, such right is usually only given for the purpose of saving life or a cargo carried out, but not due to delays as a result of Brexit. Uh, certain HQSB defences uh, can, can uh, be found in Article 42L and 44 and can be useful. I'll quickly read out the provisions of Article 44. Any deviation in saving or attempting to save life or property at sea or any reasonable deviation shall not be deemed to be an infringement or breach of the rules of a, court of a contract of carriage and the carrier shall not be liable for any loss or damage resulting thereon. In view of the above, a carrier must act in good faith and not unreasonably. Furthermore, it is important to note that the, the UK, uh, the, the British courts have also tended to construe any contractual deviation clauses very narrowly. Therefore, any deviation to another, another UK port would inevitably cause some delays with delivery of a cargo, which subsequently would have to be transshipped by road or rail to the original destination. Therefore, this is also a risk that delivery at the alternative port is made to a party which is not entitled to the delivery of a cargo. Furthermore, it is necessary to ensure that cargo is discharged safely. Therefore, in view of those uh, other potential complications, and uh, naturally the question it would arise as to who should assume that additional risk and additional cost which would be incurred as a result. We always advise that an agreement from all involved parties is required for deviation. In particular, uh, the p &I cover may be prejudiced uh, and as a result, prior approval from the p and club will be required. If charters 
give lawful order to deviate from the agreed route. The owners uh, should also seek uh, uh, to see if they are entitled to receive any indemn indemnity from the charters in respect of any additional uh, cost or losses. Uh, due to the, the delays, uh, line operators uh, we see can be particularly uh, severely affected by the delays, which may have a, a severe knock-on effect on their operations. Uh, therefore, the carriers need to check their bill of lading terms in order to ensure that the terms give them flexibility when it comes to the alternative routing and transshipment. I will also briefly touch in my presentation uh, this, uh, the possibility of strikes, although hopefully uh, the ports uh, strikes and blockades uh, will be avoided. However, in the unlikely event of blockades, uh, for example, by fishermen or other groups, uh, the carriers may seek to exclude or limit uh, any liability in this regard. Uh, as you know, bills of lading often incorporate the Hague uh, with the uh, rules by way of clause paramount. And the following may be relevant uh, to Brexit, which is Article 4, Rule 2J, Defence, which may be available to the carriers and states the following. Neither the carrier nor the ship shall be responsible for loss or damage arising or resulting from strikes or lockouts or stoppage or restraints of labour from whatever cause whether partial or general. How, uh, furthermore, uh, strike clauses uh, can be found in contracts, uh, but they vary considerably in their form and in their effect. For example, uh, in a well-known case of Carburg's uh, versus Louis Dreyfus commodities, a clause in the Welsh uh, coal charter form uh, provided that in case of strikes, um, or uh, any other incidents, uh, including accidents beyond the control of charters, which prevent or delay the discharging, such time is not to count unless the vessel is already on demerge. And the English Court of Appeal held that so long as the strike was the effective cause of the delay, the period of the delay in cargo operations directly caused by the strike was to be discounted from the calculation of later. Further, the charters were also protected from the effects of strikes, which prevented or delayed the vessel from entering a berth to, to discharge. S similar and uh, varied provisions can also be found in Clause 16 of Genko 1994 form. Therefore, uh, we advise you to check very carefully the terms of your contract in order to ensure that they correctly reflect the agreed risk and cost sharing arrangements between the parties. I have come to the end of my presentation and I hope you will find it useful. If you have any further questions, please do not hesitate to contact us. Thank you for listening and I wish you success in the new normal. Well, thank you very much, Rosie That was uh, and Beth and, and indeed to Bob. Um, that was a very thorough run through. Um, we're now moving on to the port section of our presentation today. For those of you who, who uh, we are running slightly behind, but we'll, we'll catch up hopefully in this section and it's in all likelihood during my presentation shortly. Um, our first talk today uh, on ports is from Richard Ballantyne. Uh, Richard is the chief executive of the British Ports Association. He joined the association in 2007 and became its chief executive uh, in 2016. He represents the BPA to a number of industry bodies and is a member of a wide range of government stakeholder groups and European committees. He sits on the European Seaports Organisations Executive Committee, the Maritime UK Board, and is also a Director of Port Skills and Safety. Before joining the BPA, he spent five years at a Westminster political consultancy and was previously an MP's researcher in the House of Commons. So uh, he's well versed in all the politics that surrounds uh, the issues. So I would ask Richard to take over control of the presentation and go forward. If you could just do that, Richard. I uh, uh, can't hear you, Richard. Is yes, you hello, Tony, and oh, thank fantastic. you very much. And uh, it's great to see everyone. I think, Tony, thank you for your introduction. And I think um, I think I'd better change my bio, actually, because it talks about me being still on the ESPO. That's the European Seaports Board. And I think post Brexit, that's something we better kind of filter, although we'll be very much working with our European colleagues and partners. We won't have the full uh, membership rights that we had before. And that is true of many things, of course. <laughs> anyway, moving on with my presentation, I hope everybody can see my slides. I think I'm on the 
on the first one there. So if there's any issues, please, Tony, do pipe up and tell me. Um, effectively, uh, what, what is the BPA quickly? Um, BPA is a trade association. This is what I like to call my propaganda. Uh, and we're a body that represents over 400 ports up and down the country. Some of them very modest, and very small, others uh, the largest of them all, of course, ranging from unmanned fishing ports and piers in uh, Western Scotland through to big ports like London and the Humber uh, and uh, others are, uh, like Dover, et cetera, around the country. We'll come to Dover shortly. Uh, but we do represent 86% of the tonnage handled at UK ports. Another point just to, uh, just to highlight is that um, port tonnages and throughputs are expected to grow substantially and unitized freight, unitized freight, as you probably know, is uh, containers and row row freight. Uh, that is expected to grow substantially uh, along with uh, port freight across the UK by 2050, subject, subject to us getting through things like the pandemic, et cetera. And, and I'll, ex I'll explain a little bit about what trade looks like um, on this slide here. I'm happy to share these slides, by the way, so feel free not to scribble down any details if, if they are of interest. I'm sure uh, Tony and his colleagues can circulate those in due course. Uh, they will be circulated, Richard, just to be clear. Good stuff. Um, but, but effectively, you'll see there that um, bulk commodities, liquids and dry bulks, uh, take up the, the overwhelming majority of our cargo handle at ports. But that's predominantly in weight. In value, we're looking at Roro and Lolo, so containers, as being quite a substantial part of our um, network. And unlike other major ports and maritime states, roll-on, roll-off cargo is substantial in the UK. And that is just the nature of our geography, where we are being a fed country, import-driven economy, uh, and adjacent to a big market like the UK. So what does that actually mean uh, in terms of um, uh, Brexit, et cetera? So looking, I mean, this week, when I prepared these slides, actually, I kept it uh, very open, just seeing whether we would get a, a deal or not. We haven't yet. Potentially, we, we, we might. We don't know. But one thing we do know, deal or no deal, if that's not too much of a, a slogan, uh, it's going to look very similar as our borders uh, in either eventuality, because essentially what what's happening is the UK government has indicated we're leaving the single market and we're leaving the customs union. And what does that mean? Well, that means that we have to enforce controls at our borders. So that's custom controls and product standard controls. Uh, and included in that are things like sanitary and phytosanitary con controls on agricultural, plant and food based products, etc. The largest challenge, therefore, potentially in a customs control and other control environment is on our roll and roll off traffic. And that's effectively the ports you will be familiar with, Dover, Holyhead, Portsmouth, Immingham, and many, many more that we have around the UK. Essentially, those ports that facilitate tens of thousands of lorries and trailers uh, traveling to and from the European Union every day. And to actually stop and require each of those um, lorries or the trailers to undergo some kind of customs process is the big challenge, really, because in a conventional arrangement, Goods come in, unloaded off a ship, and they are cleared by the customs authority, the HMRC in the UK's case, and then they're allowed to be cleared and leave the port gate. If, of course, you were to stop a lorry at one of our main row-row gateways, uh, including Eurotunnel, of course, then that could cause even, even a 30-second second or 60-second delay could start to quickly um, create queues and congestion around ports. So the government has set up a special board of protocol and delivery group and also published a, a big Bible of port um, activity, the border operating model, which looks at all levels of um, controls as they will come in. So quickly on that model, uh, the BOM, which has been published in several stages in the last few months, it, it does talk about the different kind of controls that ports can look at. The government is designing something called the goods vehicle movement system, uh, which is effect effectively an IT service that will enable um, traders to pre-lodge a customs declaration uh, with a shipping line. Uh, and so that when the ferry or the railroad vessel, in, the, in as we expect, arrives, though that customs process has actually sort of started and, uh, and been undertaken and traffic will be able to proceed to where it wants to go. Uh, potentially uninterrupted. Now, it may be directed to a customs facility, either at the port or inland, where some checks are required to be undertaken. But the hope is we will avoid that actual stop and release process. 
The traditional uh, method of uh, approving goods, of course, is going to be delivered through what they call what they're branding now as the temporary storage model, which many ports already operate at the moment. So uh, a lot of our goods that are coming from the EU uh, will be going through those facilities where they're held and then approved. And they could be held for up to 90 days in a temporary storage facility, or they may be more swiftly looked after. But effectively, that is slightly more uh, likely to be the case at container terminals and bulk handling facilities, and indeed some railroad facilities as well, particularly unaccompanied facilities, or you might get a combination of both. We've broadly welcomed uh, this approach, um, notwithstanding the fact that we've got to get ready very quickly. We do like the principles behind the GVMS. Um, now, just quickly, what, what else do the, the uh, border operating model say? Well, it talks about a phased introduction of controls. And you'll see there, uh, I won't go through all the, all the points there, but effectively what is happening, and it's quite a clever move by the UK government, essentially knowing that there's going to be a lot of change the UK government is not going to be enforcing import control. So stuff coming from the European Union will still have to undertake customs formalities, but it won't be required at the border. Uh, and that's significant for us because we're all about avoiding that hold up and that congestion. You'll see there's several stages, but effectively full controls for both customs and uh, other product standards come in in July. Um, and with one exception, which is Northern Ireland, which I think I'll come to shortly. So new border infrastructure is going to be needed, of course. And what does that look like? Um, effectively, the government is uh, funding a lot of this because they've decided that we've had to wait so long that now is the time for government to get the checkbook out and start financing this. Now, this is unusual for our sector, I would say, because even government facilities and infrastructure is typically provided by port authorities to the Crown and then they staff it with border force officials or uh, or to local authority officials dealing with um, port health controls, etc. So there's a big rush uh, to build this and the government is doing two things. One is it's um, uh, it's got a fund which we expect to be announced tomorrow, which will be a fund for port operators to receive funding for their infrastructure to go ahead and build it themselves on site. But also there's some inland sites and uh, the, the most well publicised are the sites in Kent which will serve as the Port of Dover and Eurotunnel. But there are others around, of course. Um, it's probably quite messy to get into the detail of those, but I would say um, that it's fair to say across the board without singling anything particularly out, it's it's very short timescales to get things ready uh, in just over six months for July is uh, would be unprecedented. It does mean probably prices will be more as labour costs and construction materials are uh, fast tracked. Uh, but also we have to wait on things like planning approval for the on-site ports. So uh, I mentioned Northern Ireland and just quickly, uh, there's been some developments this week on Northern Ireland, but effectively the protocol uh, means that um, Northern Ireland will stay within the customs union and the single market in a de facto way. And effectively that means there will be some controls across the Irish Sea of course, just as there will be on um, southern routes between England and Wales and the Republic. Now, this means they've got to get ready as well by 1st of January, so even quicker than the rest of uh, the UK and Great Britain. Uh, and effectively, there's a big rush uh, to do this. The government has decided to design an additional um, system, the Trader Support Service, to facilitate some of these custom flows. And potentially, I'm not sure whether Richard Burnett will cover this, but effectively, um, that is uh, under sort of testing and pilot stages at the moment, and it will utilise the GVMS system that I mentioned before, which is also being tested at the moment, but it's probably not good to dwell on that too much at the moment. So our challenge, I think, potentially, uh, as we move towards the 1st of uh, January is, is on exports, because controls will be enforced at European frontiers as we go forward. Now, that doesn't mean that we're all in the clear because essentially, particularly for ferries, where we, we, we predict the potential biggest challenges, you could say delays at disembarkation at ports like Dublin, Zeebrugge um, and Calais, of course, and that might back on to um, uh, back onto ferries, affect services back to the UK. So it is something we're keeping a very uh, close eye on and a watching brief. Government is, of course, pushing out a huge campaign 
to promote the new changes to the freight industry. And we're looking to support government there. But anything you can do to amplify this to your partners and stakeholders and indeed customers would be gratefully received because I think it's going to take a, a large effort to get everybody ready. But I do think the government is hopeful that given the six month grace period they're introducing um, from the from the 1st of January on imports, they're hoping that the message will certainly get out. So our inbound traffic should be more prepared potentially. But I think Richard uh, Burnett will cover some of this in his uh, cover, uh, presentation, of course. Now, there have been some reasonable worst case scenario predictions for the government, which always get the headlines, but it does show uh, a level of um, unpreparedness from the freight sector, which I think it's fair to say is still there, although there's been a lot of attention and uh, communications. And so those numbers which were put out, I think, towards the end of the summer are likely to come down somewhat. But equally, um, there's a lot to do in a short period of time. Just quickly, away from Brexit, of course, uh, a, a kind of post-Brexit um, policy agenda the UK government has, which I'm happy to pick up later or in, in, indeed directly with anyone, is we have got this Freeports programme going at the moment, which the government launched uh, a couple of weeks ago. And there's a bidding process live in England and potentially will be rolled out to the rest of the UK in due course. And effectively, what that is, is the, these are zones of business friendly areas around ports, airports, rail hubs, etc., logistics parks, where you can set up and do things in a more uh, business friendly way. So whether that be uh, exemptions from customs duties and formalities in a, in a kind of free trade zone area or limiting tax um, uh, uh, payments on things and having things like capital allowance preferences for building, etc. Or, or business rates relief, et cetera, as well as uh, some more sort of physically tangible things like speeding up planning, planning processes and increasing the permitted development rights that a number of ports have. Uh, this is something we're quite excited about as the sector because we see a vision for uh, a kind of port zoning approach, and this very much fits with this. But there is one minor spanner in the works for us as a national association, and if we remember back to my earlier slide, we do represent a lot of ports and port areas and terminals, etc. And if you're only going to have 10 plus potentially a handful more around the whole of the UK, that means there's going to be a few winners and a lot of losers potentially. And there is quite a lot of interest in this as a as, as something that regions want to get hold of to embrace the government's levelling up agenda. Just finally, on um, some of the areas of uh, sort of legally relevant points, because I know this is a, a, a legally focused. Uh, we are looking at things that may change or may not change, of course, in the future. And I think environment and planning is something that ports have, have found a particular challenge in the last generation. And a lot of that, rightly and wrongly, has been centred around European um, legislation, things like the Habitats Directive, uh, and, and other environmental protection arrangements, which, as I say, rightly or wrongly, there is an accusation or, or a suggestion that the European Union has created this and perhaps the UK government has embraced this more than other member states of the European Union, which has led to a lot of challenges for ports in terms of pushing forward projects, particularly in the marine environment, if, if they're major projects. So we've got Project Speed uh, as a, is a sort of government initiative looking at things like this and how we how we look to um, modify those. I think will be very interesting. And it may be that we do not um, change much or it may be that we sort of make some tweaks, effect, et cetera. But I think it's fair to say there'll be a lot of opportunity for discussion on this. And depending on the nature of our governments moving forward in the next 10 years or so, I think there's going to be a general drive from industry, not just the ports industry, but across the sector to look at how we can make these planning arrangements work better for ports uh, and other developers in, in our sector. Now, that doesn't mean we're ripping up rules and tearing, tearing up environmental um, commitments that have previously been made. It's about making things work better and quicker. And we still have these things like net gain and, uh, and, and net zero to work towards. So there's no escaping from things like that. And it's something the sector is prepared for and, and looking for. Other things like the port services regulation. So this is a European regulation on the service provision at ports, things like towage, bunkerage, uh, fuel um, uh, provision, other things. They, they have some uh, rules that we don't particularly like as the sector. We think they're rather onerous and not really 
uh, centered around a private and independent ports market that we have unlike the rest of Europe. So that's something we'll be looking to get abolished and government has made some good noises about that. And of course, we are moving forward. We'll have things like the, the border strategy and what we're looking at, whether we'll have more intelligent borders, which will be built on the back of the things like the GVMS, et cetera, looking forward. And finally, fisheries policy is something to keep an eye on as well, because it's, it could be quite a pivotal point uh, affecting uh, the nature of our deal. And if we do have um, uh, commitments that require landing of fish, etc., how we get that out and get that to Europe is going to be uh, fundamental because a lot of the fish we land coming from our ports effectively is, uh, is, is exported to the European Union and we don't want that to be uh, impacted. Now, just finally, I won't go through this one by one, but this is a, a nice sort of summary of a traffic light approach to a lot of the regulations that ports have to deal with. You can get that from our website or, or Tony can circulate, etc. But it does show you the, the array of things in the policy environment, either legislation and uh, or policy announcements or codes, etc. And there's a lot of there's a lot of um, yellow, amber and red there, which shows we, we, we want to make a few changes and move some things forward. And in the post pandemic and Brexit period, officials haven't had much time to look at these kind of things. So hopefully once things settle, we will be able to get somewhere. But I think it's illustrative of the amount of things that are going on at the moment. With still a relatively new government, but um, there's quite a lot to do in a short period of time. Finally, just very quickly, uh, and I won't dwell on this because I'm sure there are experts on this call who learn a lot more, but it's something to watch is UK state aid policy. And in, in, in the port sector's case, it's the general block exemption and how we um, how we kind of deal with state aid in the future, I think would be very interesting. Uh, we're starting to think, see things like local enterprise partnerships and enterprise bodies in Scotland, for example, allocating funds toward port projects. Indeed, there was an offshore wind um, bid process announced recently for some funding for landside facilities. Uh, and that is very much about giving money to ports. And when you couple in things like free ports, it is slightly a different uh, regime than we've seen before in what has to be said is a very market led sector that isn't um, used to receiving money, certainly not systematic, systematically. So there you go, Tony, uh, back over to you. Thank you very much. I'm here for any questions if there's time. Um, well, thanks, Richard. Uh, just to be clear, we, we're not going to deal with the questions now. We'll take those at the end. OK, so uh, just some observations with, with a sort of port perspective. Uh, and I say amplifying things that have, have been said before, really, I think um, so size is going to be important. Um, bigger ports are going to find it a bit easier if you've got hard standing areas, if you've got lots of uh, land for storage of containers or unaccompanied trailers, that's going to give you options. Uh, it will give you options in, in relation to uh, the infrastructure that's going to be necessary for the new border frontier customs, border control, vets, phytosanitary, etc. It will also give you an option as to which um, uh, method, uh, whether it's temporary storage solution or the GVMS uh, uh, solution that you take. Um, if you've got land, then I think you've got a choice. If you don't have land, then I'm not sure you do. And I think you're probably going to be funneled down the GVMS um, uh, route, and that brings its own um, issues. Uh, at the bottom there, I've said the Port Infrastructure Fund oversubscribed. There's no decision yet as far as I'm aware, although I'm conscious how fluid these things are. Uh, the word on the grapevine is that there's going to be a decision uh, about the grants tomorrow. As Richard commented on, the problem here is that the, the buildings which uh, have yet to be uh, approved, funded, etc., have to be ready by the 1st of July. So it'll be interesting to see uh, whether they'll be done in time and what the cost is going to be. It, as I say, if you don't have land, then you're going to have to be creative. And the obvious uh, example of that is, is Dover, where they're talking about storage sites some 20 miles away. Um, I think that could lead to security issues and, and cost rises, greater reliance on the IT systems. And it's by no means certain that those IT systems are going to stand up, which I think Richard Burnett uh, covered in great detail. Um, so nice segue into the uh, IT systems. These are just some of them that uh, are, are, they have to knit together. So you've got the old system, Chief, CDS and so on. Um, CDS is sort of quasi old, new, um, it's coming in. But what I've done here is I, you'll see I've put 
new and bold next to some of them. The point is, you've got a lot of new, you've got a lot of systems which have to be able to talk to one another anyway. So that, that brings its own problem. A lot of them are new in addition. So uh, let's be honest, government doesn't have a very good track record with its IT rollout. Um, so those systems we just saw have to be able to speak to the port community system, have to be able to speak to the sea carrier system, have to be able to speak to the, the, uh, the overseas um, customs system, whether it's Belgium, Holland, France. Um, so there's quite a lot going on, and I think there's quite a lot of potential for um, integration failure, network breakdown, and so on. Whose fault is the breakdown? Um, well, it, it may simply be uh, a sort of congestion on the bandwidth. Um, practically, from, from my point of view, the client's point of view, does liability fall on the port? Um, if it does, um, then do they have insurance? Are they covered? Um, even if it's merely delay, uh, loss of revenue, do they have cyber insurance to cover that? Um, does their business interruption cover that or is it excluded because it's a cyber loss? So these are sorts of things that the port should be looking at at the moment in the run up to the 1st of January. Um, we've, we've talked about the reasonable worst case scenario, 7,000 lorries um, on the M20 with two day delays. Um, it's said that even if the majority of lorries are border ready, the flow could still be reduced to between 60 to 80% of normal. Uh, I think the timing here is probably good. Post Christmas, 1st January, it, it's a quieter period anyway, but um, just, uh, and I know uh, Richard Burnett mentioned this, when the French border police ran an exercise on the 24th of November, um, they did that on this side of the channel. They checked uh, Haulier's passports going over overseas. The, it is said that the delay per passenger for that exercise was 70 seconds, uh, and that resulted in a five mile tailback. Um, so 70 seconds is nothing individually, but 70 seconds in the aggregate over lots and lots of uh, vehicles quickly adds up and there's a significant congestion. Um, exporters, what I would say here is that uh, uh, if you're a port and if you are um, uh, receiving traffic to go uh, over to the continent, you should set your systems up so that um, there's a sort of green light so that you know that the cargo will be pre-released at the discharge port. So uh, what, whatever your setup is, um, what you don't want to happen is for there to be a backup of traffic because the discharge port on the European side can't clear up, uh, which then uh, forces a, a sort of backing up of the system and traffic into your port. Um, and just on that last point, um, Sealand, uh, Maersk uh, have given notices to their customers that um, they're not going to ship cargoes that um, don't have um, the full shipping information and, and that prior approval. Um, delay, I, th I think this has been done to death, um, so I will simply skip over that. Um, the ports, as well as checking the adequacy of their insurances, should be checking the adequacy of their terms and conditions. What do they say? Typically, port conditions will uh, accept some liability for damage where it's been caused by something which is clearly the port's fault. Um, they will usually uh, exclude damage for delay and consequential loss. So the question then arises, well, if, if goods perish because they've been stuck in traffic jams for uh, a significantly longer period than anticipated, uh, is that damage or is that loss by delay? Now, there is a legal answer uh, and you, know, you would get there in the end. Much better uh, and to head any dispute off so that you could you, argue this this isn't a grey area, it's black and white, is to make sure that Brexit delay is covered in your terms and conditions. Um, the point there about the COVID um, uh, Supreme Court case is that everyone thinks that there's nothing un, nothing new under the sun um, and that this this will be old, old stuff. Um, these disputes, disputes crop up all the time. Incorporation of terms and conditions. If you're going to have, as a port, uh, very onerous um, uh, exclusion terms, then 
draw attention to them. The the case there, for those that don't know, it's the, probably one of the few cases I remember from law school, Thornton versus Shoe Lane Parking. Lord Denning gave a judgment, uh, which will stick in the memory. Um, he said, if you're going to have a, an onerous term, make sure that there's a uh, something to draw, draw attention to it. Uh, for example, a red dagger in the margin dripping with blood. So um, that's not necessary. But if you do have exclusion clauses, particularly if you've got new exclusion clauses, uh, maybe put them in bold, maybe put a banner notice at the top of your terms and conditions. Um, in contract law like this, uh, you get no prizes for elegance. More is more. Just labour the point, make it crystal clear. So put notices on your website, put physical signs up in your ports, put uh, details uh, in your letter heading, your letter footer, emails and so on. And make sure this is all done uh, as soon as possible in advance of the 1st of January 2021. Additional risks, uh, so these are issues that could compound uh, what, what could be quite a difficult period anyway. Um, COVID-19 shutdowns, that looks like a receding problem, um, we hope, with the, the, the vaccine. Manpower issues. Manpower issues are going to be uh, for all sorts of reasons. Um, COVID-related issues. We understand that that's a problem uh, at Felixstowe. Um, seasonal uh, illnesses, flu could be a problem, and there could be um, sort of cabotage uh, shortages of uh, European hauliers to, to, to move the goods. Um, post COVID-19, I think it's reasonable to say that there's an expectation of an increase in economic activity. And whilst that's good, it's the sort of activity that's led to the um, the, the container uh, empties problem at UK ports. So you, you might find a, a problem of congestion, um, exacerbated conge congestion at UK container ports. Um, strikes, it's always going to be a problem. Um, we do, after all, uh, trade quite a lot with the French. Um, and the last point I think has been touched on before, uh, which is or, or, it's a question of how strictly the authorities are going to uh, stick to the rules and require um, full disclosure of documentation, uh, full compliance across the board. If they are, then the delays could be significant. Um, the hope is that if there are going to be delays, that uh, there will be a soft, uh, a light touch and that there'll be uh, a flow of, of trade. But uh, for all sorts of reasons, that might not necessarily happen. So that is all from me. Um, I'll hand you over now to the uh, capable hands of my colleague, Colin Lavelle. Colin is a legal director in our Liverpool office, and his practice area covers all things to do with ports and all things to do with shipping. So Colin, please take us away. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tony. And good afternoon, everybody. Um, what I was hoping to do was take us uh, through a sort of a more detailed analysis of some of those points that Tony has raised and that you've heard so much of so far. Um, so from that point of view, at least I might be able to get through this a bit quicker. So first of all, we've heard um, uh, about lots of various uh, potential challenges that we might be uh, facing in terms of governance, so customers measures, the implementation of them, their clarity and enforcement. Physical restrictions such as availability of space, infrastructure, adequate systems, labour. Uh, the plethora of IT systems that are around, any uh, conflicts between them, the old and the new, familiarisation, etc. And then obviously delay primary and both secondary effects uh, and uh, also in light of uh, the impact of COVID. So uh, what can we do? Well, um, uh, I think preparation is key. Um, as Tony has touched on, suitable terms and conditions um, are um, uh, the best way of creating clarity between the parties and then incorporation, battle of the forms, um, uh, could uh, are, are important uh, aspects to remember, and then enforceability with onerous and unfair terms. Um, so in terms of the preparation, well, try to anticipate the likely challenges and issues. Do your terms and conditions deal with these? And if so, how? Um, obviously, no one size fits all. So your terms should really be bespoke to your business and your particular challenges that you will have. Um, and are they or, or will they be incorporated? Um, and then, as I say, we'll consider the challenges through battle of the forms and enforceability. So first of all, incorporation and for terms and conditions to be binding, it's important to remember that they need to be incorporated, i.e. agreed into the agreement between the parties at the formation of the contract. Um, 
the overarching point is before you can rely on them, they need to be incorporated at the right time. It's therefore important to understand that when the contract is formed within your business procedures, that that's, um, uh, that's when the terms are incorporated, as it is at this stage that they must be incorporated. And that's why advertising, as Tony touched on, uh, to the maximum extent is important. So references on physical signs, reports and invoices and email footers, etc. Um, bear in mind that where um, there are um, conflicting terms and conditions as between different parties, then courts have, have been known to conclude that where there is a conflict, then there is no agreement between the parties as to the actual terms and the applicable terms of those implied by statute, which is not a position you want to be in. Uh, alternatively, um, if you can evidence any terms that were agreed in the, in the pre-formation discussions, then sometimes they can be relied upon. So how do you incorporate them? Well, the best way is by signature, um, or it can also be done by written confirmation, emails, for instance. Verbal acceptance is also uh, fine, except that uh, trying to prove that they've been accepted when there's been verbal acceptance can be complicated and difficult. Conduct of the parties, so uh, parties um, uh, carrying out the services or, or receiving the services in accordance with the uh, terms um, uh, by their conduct can be can incorporate them and also by reference, as I say, by advertising. Uh, you can also uh, incorporate them by previous dealings, but this is a risky approach because your current dealings need to be consistent with the previous dealings in which those terms are incorporated. Um, and then beware of battle of the forms, which is, is, is essentially a, a legal reference to a situation when both parties to a contract attempt to incorporate their own terms. Uh, the general rule is the party who, who attempted to incorporate their la terms last and that they weren't explicitly rejected prior to formation of the contract or those terms will apply. So how do you deal with that battle of the form situation? Well, a document signed by all parties setting out the terms and expressly excluding all other terms is the best way to successfully incorporate your own terms. Where that isn't possible, make it clear in all communications and contractual documentation that you will only do business on your terms. Continue uh, this reference uh, to your own terms in all of your dealings, email footers, etc., uh, and ensure consistency in your business processes so that uh, the incorporation of your terms really happens as a matter of course when you are um, conducting and concluding your uh, negotiations and, and contracts. And bear in mind that um, it's also worth having in your terms and conditions an express rejection of the application of, a, of the other party's terms and conditions just as a, as a belt and braces approach. Uh, onerous or unfair terms, uh, um, essentially it can be tempting for businesses to include particularly onerous terms uh, within their conditions. And before doing this, though, be mindful that um, a party seeking to rely on an onerous term will need to demonstrate that they took reasonable steps to bring it to the attention of the counterparty. This is, of course, the reference to Lord Denning's judgment that uh, Tony referred to. The more onerous the term, the more that needs to be done to bring it to the other party's uh, attention. Bear in mind as well that whether a term will be considered onerous or not in the first place will we'll turn on the facts. But a good point of reference is whatever the standard uh, industry practice is. If a, if a term is standard, in, standard industry practice, then it's less likely to be considered onerous. So bear that in mind. Um, where there are no industry standard terms to set its benchmark uh, and you have concerns, it's better to err on the side of caution and treat it as if it would be unenforceable. OK, uh, unfair terms in a business to business transactions include exclusions of liability for death or personal injury, and then also any losses caused by negligence or defective or poor quality goods, but only where to do so is reasonable. What is reasonable is determined by the court, depending on the information available to both parties at the time. And relevant factors include whether the contract was negotiated or whether it was concluded on standard terms, uh, the buyer's bargaining power, those sorts of things. OK. Um, so clarity of responsibility is key. So there's various section, various uh, references there that you it's worth considering in your terms and conditions when reviewing these things. But just to touch on a few of those uh, aspects uh, with a, in, a, in a Brexit context, um, uh, I'll go through those in the next few slides now. So customs and government systems, uh, efficient customs clearance is crucial clearly to through port traffic flow. Um, it's uh, worth catering uh, within your terms for costs associated with or incurred due to the new or revised customs or other clearance arrangements. Also, there's been reference to the goods vehicle movement system, whether it will have sufficient functionality. Um, well, it's important to remember that any uh, associated delay with that or uh, similar substitute or additional services should also be incorporated. And also bear in mind any local authority schemes, for instance, traffic management, local travel permits, that sort of thing, um, to um, uh, within, within your terms and conditions that might cause the delay. Uh, within the definitions, make sure your definitions are suitable for all likely Brexit related scenarios. So, for instance, uh, definitions for competent authorities or services should also include all government bodies such as uh, Border Force, HMRC. 
um, incorporate a, um, reference to applicable charges or procedures by government agencies in the event of application of unexpected levies or procedures and consider existing or additional phytosanitary regulations or requirements, especially in light of the complications around COVID. So in terms of labour and uh, uh, supply of labour and, and delay and that sort of thing. In terms of delay, force majeure provisions, if applicable, as, as Beth uh, and Rosie went through, should include reference to delays arising from examination of goods or entry processing faults arising from agency actions, requirements or procedures. And the, the losses associated with that should uh, with that delay should include deterioration of cargo, perishing of goods, containing demerge and detention, etc. Uh, other important aspects to incorporate here are warranties and indemnities, so to include an express indemnity um, for associated customs related charges, uh, express warranty that customer or authorised agent holds all necessary permits and authorities required for the transmission of the goods to and from the port, uh, and include obviously an indemnity for all consequential loss arising from uh, any breach of that. And also any uh, include any customer requirement to provide sufficient and accurate information as to perishability or time criticality of a cargo in advance or within a reasonable period of, of request with the associated indemnities again. Um, and then anti-taxation prevention provide for both parties to have measures in place to ensure uh, facilitation of tax evasion is prevented. Uh, include positive obligation on the customer to correctly calculate the customs charges due as likely due to VAT miscalculations uh, mean it's harder to assess the amount of, uh, of bank guarantees required uh, and seek to limit associated reputational risk within anti-tax evasion uh, provisions. And then finally, uh, something to bear in mind is to include a right um, to terminate, suspend or cancel provisions of the services in the event the customer fails to meet any of those obligations that we've just gone through. Um, so in summary, preparation is key. Um, uh, to overcome, we first need to adapt, uh, and I hope that helps, and thank you for listening. Um, so, ladies and gentlemen, Richard Burnett is the Chief Executive of the Road Haulage Association. Richard's career in logistics has spanned 35 years. It doesn't look old enough, I have to say. During that time, he's worked for many well-known logistics operations, looking after some of the most prestigious high street names. Since joining the RHA almost six years ago, he's restructured it, making it a far more relevant and effective organization that delivers value for its members with a powerful and effective lobbying voice. He and the RHA have campaigned on a wide range of industry issues, including the skills shortage, Brexit fuel prices, migrant camps in Calais, air quality and electric vehicles. If it's road transport related, then the RHA has a view on it. And as the figurehead, Richard makes regular appearances in the media at international national and local level and for those of you who are watching channel 4 news last night he was was on there flying the flag for the rha and just before you kick off richard um just to be, be clear we're going to put questions to richard directly after his presentation so if you have questions please submit them now i will collate those we have a few already for you i just to forewarn you richard but otherwise um the floor is yours please go ahead Tony, thank you. Thank you very much for that introduction. And um, I, I'd also like to say thank you to Richard Ballantyne and his presentation, because I think that uh, he's painted a fantastic picture. And uh, I guess now I can add a bit of colour to that picture as well. Um, so, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm Richard, Burnett, chief exec of the RHA, uh, been in post for about six years and uh, the first chief exec to have come from the industry. Um, so I'm, I'm very sort of clued up in terms of the operational impact of a lot of the things that we, we, we get involved in. Uh, and if you look at the presentation, a slightly different play uh, on the Brexit transition, what could possibly go wrong, Mr Gove? And uh, I guess what I've tried to do is, is, is bring this uh, sort of into the real world uh, in terms of some of the challenges and issues that I have been you know, facing, uh, you know, personally dealing with government over the last, well, certainly over the last three or four years, but more latterly over the, over the next few weeks. So the things that I'm going to sort of talk you through now is, is who have we been working with within government on transition? So one of the departments, it's been a really complicated process. I'm going to talk you through the current market conditions and some of the challenges that we're facing. Some of them have been mentioned today, but, but you know, some of them you, you may, may or may not be aware of. Um, is the UK and EU ready for transition? And what are the big issues that we see uh, within, within that transition that's ahead of us? I want to talk to you about the customs intermediary market, the onboarding of traders and hauliers from a practical perspective, the Northern Ireland Protocol and Trader Support Service that, you know, again, Richard Ballantyne uh, alluded to earlier, inland infrastructure, system readiness, these are all challenges, market access for hauliers, a symmetrical deal, what does that look like? And then what's the perception of EU hauliers in the EU supply 
food supply companies as well at this point in time on what are their concerns. So, you know, what could possibly go wrong, Mr. Gove? Well, you know, we've been talking to, to Mr. Gove for some time. Uh, we've been in negotiation, I guess, I guess with him in discussion, uh, Grant Shapps. You can see here on this slide as it pops up, literally every government department that has been involved in, uh, you know, driving, I guess, the Brexit negotiations, but the level of detail across each and one of these departments that means that, 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 that we have to have interaction uh, to know how this is going to impact on various parts uh, of, of uh, the industry that we that we represent. But if we actually look at the current market conditions and we look at the challenges that we're currently facing, uh, you know, as, as, as an industry, um, we've been dealing with COVID this year. It's been a significant challenge. We're building for Christmas. You know, Christmas is, 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 a, is a challenging time, uh, you know, at the best of times. But we've also got transition that we're having to deal with as well. But, you know, organisations, logistics businesses are dealing with each of those issues in that order right now. That's where their focus is. COVID, Christmas, transition. Um, we've talked again about, about delays, you know, transition stock build. We've already been seeing delays at Dover and Eurotunnel, you know, ahead of, ahead of uh, you know, transition. Uh, and part of the reason for that is, is uh, you know, the French frontier police have been doing passport checks to almost demonstrate as part of the negotiation the impact that, that could be seen, uh, you know, on the short straits um, when, when checks are put in place. And literally over the last two weeks, we have seen significant queues in Dover, Folkestone and across in Calais, creating, you know, challenges for, for you know, for hauliers and the supply chain to get to get volume through. The container ports are absolutely creaking. Uh, you know, this is this has been an issue for for some months now. And we've been talking to the Department of Transport about the challenges that we're facing around the container ports. Felixstowe has been discussed and talked about, you know, quite a bit. I think their issues are slightly different to the other ports. But that replenishing, uh, you know, of container volume uh, and that stock build of container volume in both, you know, in terms of both putting volume back into the supply chain, but transition build as well. And the issues in terms of repatriation of containers has caused a significant issue and again about that with Honda's supply chain today. But, you know, there's a big knock on effect to hauliers because if we can't get the volume out of the ports quickly because of productivity issues, then that has a knock on effect to drivers hours, delays, problems that we're facing there. We've also got this issue of, you know, warehousing within the UK. Literally, we've only got 3% of the total warehousing space available is available at this point in time. And that's creating problems and delays. Where are we going to put these containers with PPE that are sitting, you know, on the quayside, uh, you know, within uh, UK warehousing when we've got this significant challenge? And then coupled to that, we also have a driver shortage, which I'm sure you've, you've heard about. It's not a new phenomenon, but this year has, has, has really exacerbated the problem. 60,000 HGV drivers short and growing. We have lost 20, 26,000 test slots this year. Uh, because of COVID and the fact we couldn't test people. 60,000 EU drivers driving the UK, many of those went back because of COVID. And, you know, effectively what we're seeing is many of those are not coming back uh, after they repatriated back to the EU. Um, so, you know, growing issues there, 500 million uh, paid into the apprenticeship levy. We've only been able to access 50 million of that. And this is a backdrop to, you know, all of the problems that we are now going to be facing ahead of transition. It's a very difficult and challenging time. So is the UK and the EU ready for transition? I would say absolutely not. There are businesses getting ready, uh, but I think that, that you know, at this stage, it certainly doesn't feel from where we sit that, that businesses are, are ready and prepared enough. Um, I think you know the reason behind that there's been too many false dawns businesses kind of don't don't believe this is going to happen i know that's hard that's hard to believe but but the problem is the messaging has been very very confused and if you take things that grant chaps has been saying he's been saying in the press let's see what deal we get let's plan for the worst and hope for the best it sounds like the deal is going to unlock you know the potential for us to uh, to not have to do some of these things that's simply not the case deal or no deal we are going to have to put this custom regime in place we're going to have to prepare for that and business needs to prepare itself. We have been asking for a border operating model. And again, Richard talked about that in his presentation, but we've been asking for three years for that border operating model. You know, so why isn't business getting ready? Well, the first iteration of that came out on the 13th of July. Lots of gaps. 
206 page document uh, on the second of, uh, sorry, second uh, border operating model came out in October. Uh, and the border operating model tells you what to do, but it doesn't tell you how to do it. And, you know, that's a big issue for business if they if they're trying to use this document to understand what those processes are because they've never done it before. It really is difficult to follow. Again, the point about deal or no deal, 95 percent of the processes within that border operating model are going to remain the same, whether it is a deal or no deal, and they are going to create friction. My point you know, is that, that customs is complicated. Um, the border operating model points you towards customs agents and customs brokers because many logistics businesses do not have to deal with customs, haven't had to deal with customs and don't have this expertise. And we know that there is a significant shortage of customs agents and brokers in the UK and EU market as it stands today. So let's focus on that customs intermediary market, uh, you know, just, just for a minute. And let's remind ourselves that it's 37 years since we ha last had to do customs for the European market. And over that period of time, trade has tripled. Uh, you know, we, we, we've had this dramatic increase in trade, but we've also lost an enormous amount of that experience. You know, if you look at the port of Dover, for instance, and the, the customs intermediaries there, there were something like 200, you know, customs companies doing uh, this work 37 years ago. We've now got 15. And it shows you how much of that experience we've lost. The customs declarations that we're going to have to absorb, you know, we're doing 50 million customs declarations for the rest of the world right now. From the first of the first, we will have to do another 200 million declarations based upon current level, levels of trade per annum with the EU. And we'll have to do 20 million declarations per annum for Northern Ireland. And the estimates based upon levels of productivity estimated that we would need another 50 million customs agents to do that. Now, there may be some elements of productivity in terms of systemizing some of this stuff. But at the moment, the onboarding process, the detail, the knowledge, the amount of time that it takes to train a customs agent, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a year to, uh, to become competent, probably three years to become an expert. These are significant challenges in terms of being able to expand the customs intermediary market at the rate that we need. And government's view and the conversations that I've had with, with Michael Gove and Lord Agnew believe that the market is expanding. We don't. They've done an Ipsos Mori poll, you know, probably about three or four weeks ago, which which reckon there is a fourfold increase, giving a capacity of somewhere in the region of 76 million. They can't be sure, but they think between 76 and 119 million. Now, that doesn't kind of correlate when we've got to deal with 270 million declarations, uh, you know, effectively from the early part of, of next year uh, in terms of a run rate. So, you know, Government is pointing through the border operating model traders and businesses and hauliers to that customs intermediary market to be able to give them the, the detail and the knowledge of how to, to pick these processes up. Um, the onboarding process for, for traders and hauliers is incredibly complicated. And what we're finding, you know, the RHA has got its own customs brokerage and we have got businesses coming to us that simply do not understand the basic principles of what this means to them. And we're having to literally hold them by the hand and talk them through it. Um, you know, we are inundated. Those those hauliers and traders are reaching out. But, but you know, we're talking them through their liabilities. We're talking them through the operational process, master data requirements and the financial implications. And when you go through all of that, they go back to their businesses, they go back to the boards and their boards now want to understand because they don't understand the financial implications of this. And we're having to take many you know, boards through this detail as well. Inco terms, the basic terms under which we trade, the URIA number, the different systems that we're going to have to interface and use, CDS, Chief, GVMS, um, HGV checker, you know, checker HGV is ready to cross the border. You know, that's that, that's an add-on system, which is only a temporary system, just okay. to make sure I found this. just to make sure that, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're ahead of the game in terms of the paperwork. But it but it is a trusted system where you have to input the information to be able to give you a Kent access pass. Um, how you complete a declaration, what is what's the common transit convention? What's the tier convention? These are all things that these businesses are asking because they've never had to do it before. And we're having to teach you know, take them through the level of detail and it takes time. You cannot underestimate the amount of time that it's taking to onboard these hauliers, these traders, these businesses to take them through what this looks like. And we're finding that we're having to turn people away now 
because we are absolutely inundated with the, the amount of time that it's taking to do this. That master data cleansing where you're matching, you know, uh, your, your product codes to effectively the customs codes and the tariffs takes an enormous amount of time and people don't realize that that's part of what we're having to access and get to, uh, you know, within, within this process. Um, the Northern Ireland Protocol. Now, yeah, there has been some breaking news on this today. I haven't had time to really get into the detail of what it means for us, apart from the fact that, that you know, we're talking about some relaxations for a period of time, certainly for um, uh, the, the food retailers. But I guess, you know, the point that we were trying to make about the, the Northern Ireland Protocol is this is incredibly complicated as well for UK business that is importing, uh, you know, products into Northern Ireland now. And um, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's a big part of, of, of the challenge that the hauliers are going to certainly face, uh, you know, in terms of that onboarding process and in terms of the level of detail that we are going to have to provide uh, in order to, 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 to process volume through into Northern Ireland. Um, if you think about a retail food, food supply chain and the number of products that you're shipping into, uh, into Ireland, and the EPOS process that drops into the warehouse to, you know, to, to pick that product to then dispatch it, but then do a declaration for every item, every product. It's almost an impossible task to do that within the time. And that'll be part of the reason why, you know, Michael Gove has listened to what we've been saying, which is this is impossible to implement within the time that, that, that we're talking about. You need to make sure there are some easements around that. But this, this, this shouldn't just just be for, 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 for food retail movements, it should be for every aspect of what we're supplying into Northern Ireland. Now, you know, government has actually come up with the Trader Support Service to provide that service to businesses for a two year period. But this is an incredible challenge, you know, at the same time that we're facing with the shortage of customs intermediaries. This consortium led by Fujitsu, Shankar Singham, who some of you may well have heard about, and the Customs Co uh, Consortium, which is a consortium of, of both hauliers and uh, you know, I, I guess food importers um, have come together to provide this service for Northern Ireland, and they're they're incredibly challenged to deliver this service on time. Fujitsu have only employed 100 people out of their 600 uh, call centre staff to provide triage support and help to businesses that are going to be using this service. And the Customs Consortium three weeks ago had only employed 28 of 75 customs agents required to. Uh, you know, on board these customs and deal with their declarations. And they've been openly poaching or trying to poach staff from other customs agents around the UK, offering almost double the salary, which clearly demonstrates that this shortage of customs agents is a significant problem when a government backed scheme cannot even provide that service, uh, I guess, to its own. Um, there's 20,000 traders that have signed up to this service as of last week. Now, sign up is one thing. But onboarding is, a, a, you know, completely another. And again, this probably goes back to the reason why Gove has tried to look for and governments tried to look for some easements around Ireland, because to get this in place uh, and to onboard and go through the level of detail that I've talked about is almost impossible with the time left. I think it's fair to say the market has no confidence in the trusted, uh, trusted trader um, or, or sorry, the, 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 the trader support service at this point in time because of the consortium and because of conflicts as well because of some of those members and there's lots of hauliers and lots of distribution businesses that don't want to use it. So this is just adding another level of complexity to some of the challenges that we're facing. So supply chain um, uh, timing is also a significant issue around Northern Ireland as well. And when you think about what we're putting into place, uh, you know, in terms of the processes um, to get to uh, to get to, to, to Ireland, where we've got to take product once we've done the declarations to an office of departure to depart those loads. At the moment, we don't have to do that. We just go straight to the ferry, we dispatch, we go. But we're going to have to literally pick up from retailers, manufacturers, take it to the, the office of departure, then dispatch. And that's going to put significant time into the supply chain. That hasn't been built into any process yet. And that also creates delays. DEFRA, completely unaware how the market really operates and really works within this environment either. And we're facing lots of challenges around the complexities around VET certificates, health certificates, uh, and how seals should be applied when we're picking up product for uh, groupage and uh, consolidation to, to then take to the ferry to sign off and release. So, you know, we're facing lots and lots of issues around Northern Ireland. The devil's in the detail in terms of what's been talked about today. We will need to work through that detail, really understand whether or not it helps or uh, supports business and, um, you know, 
just just take some balance at that point in time. Just going back to the the sort of other issues that we're facing inland infrastructure. So so again, um, you know, Richard talked about the inland in infrastructure sites um, that the government is investing in. Some of them are ready, some of them aren't ready, but we literally haven't had any detail uh, from government up until this week in terms of. Uh, Richard, we seem to have lost your um, sound. Right, I think somebody. Yeah, that's it. Yes, yeah, yeah. thanks, somebody, Richard. Yeah, somebody had disabled it. I think. Um, so. I guess part part of the issue with these with these inland centres is, is is that if we don't know what how this infrastructure infrastructure is going to be used or how, how it's going to operate, uh, how can how can businesses plan? How can logistics businesses plan and know where they're, they're able to send vehicles to to do office of departure? Uh, you know, wh wh where where can they actually do the the, the Pfizer sanitary checks when they come in? Uh, there's a lot of information that is still outstanding. There's clearly not been any consideration given as well from the government in terms of. Uh, the practical operational side of things, you know, Warrington uh, as an office of departure, if you look at that site, the 70 parking spaces, um, something like a thousand vehicles that are going to be going through that site pretty much every day. And they've, 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 not, they've not looked at the productivity issues in terms of how many vehicles can we get through with people learning on the job and therefore what congestion is that going to cause on an industrial estate, literally just off the, the, the M6 where you've got large logistics businesses doing distribution on a daily basis. Systems not ready, GVMS, CDS not ready, not tested. Um, these are challenges that are real and that we're facing, and they're looking to switch GVMS on on the 23rd of December with no pressure testing. So we don't even know whether or not these systems are going to hold up, uh, you know, or, or 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 fall over. And these are the challenges that the that you know the, the logistics industry right now is having to deal with. Final slide, just very quickly, is about market access for hauliers. And this is about, you know, the real understanding of, 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 um, of, of where are we up to in terms of market access. Um, at the moment, we have unfettered access, you know, through the community license uh, and international operators licenses. Uh, and, you know, it means that we can, we can drive across Europe. But as it stands to today, we don't know what that deal looks like. And we don't know whether or not we are going to have, uh, you know, access rights from, from the 1st of January. We've been told by government that there will be a glide path, even in the event of no deal, where potentially the EU and the UK will agree to a period of possibly six months where we still have the same access rights. But at the end of that period, we will need to move towards ECMT permits. And we know at the moment there's roughly 2,000 ECMT permits for 39,000 trucks. ECMT may actually increase that allocation to 4,000 but we will still have to negotiate bilateral agreements with each of the countries in order to get access to the EU. And that's a significant challenge for, for, for UK hauliers. Um, and I think that, that, that this uncertainty at the moment, that lack of clarity, that lack of communication is absolutely killing businesses, not knowing whether or not they could be able to you know, operate and function uh, you know, from, from January the 1st. The other issue around market access is about cabotage. And cabotage, you know, is is about the number of loads that we can we can uh, partake in while we're in a, a, a an EU country, and, and and at the moment we have the right to do three loads of cabotage within that country before we return within a week. The EU wants to remove that completely. They don't want it on the table at all. <clears throat> if we do get a deal, we might get two loads, but at the moment their position is zero. Now, for the concert haulage industry, this is going to have a massive impact because the only way that they're going to be able to operate going forward is by actually rebasing and moving their businesses into Europe to have a European base uh, and a European operating uh, you know, centre at a time when they have been decimated, they have no money. And, and this is a serious, a serious impact when they do 85% of literally all concert tours in the UK and Europe. Um, you know, that's, that's a massive challenge for that specific sector. And it's probably the only niche sector that is really truly impacted by, by 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 cabotage removal, but you know I think what governments are trying to do is they're trying to make sure the symmetry of these market access rights are 
you know, the same on both sides. And if the EU don't play ball, then they will effectively remove the rights for EU hauliers as well. <coughs> Excuse me. Sorry, one, 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 one last slide, which is just about EU haulier perception and uh, EU food supply chains. I think there is a growing sort of bow wave of, of, of opinion across Europe, certainly from EU hauliers that are concerned about vehicles being stuck in queues uh, from next year. Now, I'm not saying that from the 1st of January, we're gonna stop see queues. I think we'll probably see a building effect. Um, you know, if we don't get a deal that provides us with an implementation period, um, but those EU, EU haulies are very concerned about that, and they're already saying that we're not going to come to the UK uh, because we don't want to get stuck in those queues. I think it's also fair to say that the EU food manufacturing businesses are also beginning to review, you know, with their level of confidence about, about um, fluidity at the border as to, as to whether or not they will continue to supply, certainly for the first month, uh, you know, in January, <clears throat> where they're shipping short shelf life product that may well get written off because it's in queues for you know two days now that's a significant issue i think you know for for, for both su uh, food supply for defra uh, you know for, for ourselves in terms of secondary distribution within the uk um but when you think that 30 percent of our food comes from europe and they're talking about potentially cutting 50 percent of that because they don't want it to be uh, you know to be stuck in queues that's a significant issue so now, this presentation, these are all issues <clears throat> that I have absolutely taken to Michael Gove. These are issues that I've, I've uh, discussed with him and Lord Agnew and with grad chaps, you know, over the last sort of few weeks, months. <clears throat> They're issues that, that still seem to drop to the bottom of the pile. And we don't get real focus on answering those questions and actually providing the industry with the, the tools properly. Like I say, if we do get a deal, we need an implementation period on both sides that's going to really support, uh, you know, the EU and the UK's ability to trade going forward. Tony. Richard, well, that was that was brilliant. Thank you very much. Some some fairly blunt words, uh, but lots of detail. And I'm, and I'm sure you're uh, um, I must love you when you turn up for these meetings. Richard, um, how are you fixed for time? Probably got, probably got five five more minutes. Five minutes. OK, well, I've just got a couple of, couple of questions then to fire at you, if I can. Um, uh, you kind of covered it, but on the issue of cabotage, is there a, a draft agreement on the table or, or, or your comments just your no, assumptions? So, 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 so that, that they're not. And, and we, we've been working very closely with DFT, <clears throat> where particularly the, the music industry sector, which is clearly decimated by this problem, it really genuinely is. Um, we had conversations with DFT yesterday, briefing this sector, and the, the, there is, you know, the EU position is nothing. Uh, and you know, at, at this stage, we're we're managing people's perceptions that that, that you know, if we do get a deal, uh, you know, it looks like nothing at the moment. But we would be very lucky to get possibly two, but at the moment, zero. Okay, well, that, that's very interesting. Uh, and and you you also commented in your uh, talk about uh, the the. French Frontier Police, and and you made the the point that you <laughs> there was a suspicion that this might be part of the negotiation tactic. Um, I mean, do you foresee or do you fear that official officiousness, if you want to call it that, um, could be deployed just to um, for, for mischief and and be a a complicating factor? I, look, I, I think we're going to see a, an increasing number of issues for those British holders that do manage to access Europe. On you know will be an easy target. Uh, I think we 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 felt that for years and years, uh, and it's it's only going to exacerbate. And you know the tactics that are being played at the moment uh, are very practical and tactical, and they're they're trying to make a point. You know at this at this eleventh hour, there's no doubt about that. Um, but you know I guess I guess what we what we have to consider as well in the event of of no deal, you know in terms of fishing and blockades and and uh, you know I guess the short straights that's going to be a significant challenge if if we face probably something similar to what we faced in 2015 with the you know with the migrant crisis so um not not trying to alarm but but you know we we are already having uh you know significant attacks on drivers uh you know over the last two weeks as as uh, there is an increase increase in migrant activity okay and and final question um is it's a bit sort of prosaic but there's 
a lot of sort of talk about non-compatibility or non-compliance of pallets. Uh, I mean, is that is that really a thing? Yeah, is no, that a practical problem. It, it, well, it, it absolutely is because the, the, there's a requirement for heat-treated pallets, uh, you know, as as part of as part of the standards and as part of the deal. Uh, and we we don't have we don't have enough of them. We have nowhere near enough uh, heat-treated pallets uh, to be able to, you know, uh, I guess support the level of exports um, that we're doing. So so this is a it, it is a, it's a significant area of detail and potential problem. Um, I think I think look we are where we are and we're going to have to work through all of these issues. Um, we've run out of time, um, you know. And we have to face facts that, that that we are going to have to work through a lot of these issues almost in a live operational disaster recovery uh, sort of approach now, um, because because this isn't going to be pretty from what we can see. Uh, certainly in the conversations that we're having with with hauliers and traders that are struggling to get ready within the time. Okay. Well, look, Richard, uh, thank you for your time. I know how, how pressed you are. Um, if Unless you've got anything else to say, uh, I'll thank you very, very much. Uh, we'll be in touch afterwards. Um, and I'm sure I'll speak on behalf of all the audience. So, yeah, thanks again. And good Pleasure. luck in your, in your talk. Thank you. All right. Take care. Thank you. Thanks. Bye bye. Um, the next talk will be from my colleague, George Kelly. Uh, George specializes in advising clients on indirect taxes. VAT, excise and customs duties, and customs procedures, tariff classification, origin, and customs facilitation regimes. Um, George, I I will take I'll take this, and then we'll, we'll just move it on to your slide. So bear with us, please. Thank you. Okay, uh, I'm. Um, uh, just going to concentrate uh, mostly on uh, import procedures uh, and some of the customs issues that uh, surround those. Um, we've heard um, some very um, illuminating um, comments, from, particularly from R Richard Burnett, uh, about the practicalities of moving goods, particularly on uh, uh, by road. Um, I'm going to talk to you about some of the issues that have come up uh, in my practice, certainly in recent weeks or months. Um, and hopefully that will give you an insight as to um, some of the some of those uh, things that people may not have um, come across before. Um, I, I would preface it by saying uh, that many of the um, uh, dealings with customs and even the border force um, for people who uh, import goods from the rest of the world, um, many of the things I'm going to say will be familiar. Uh, but of course, um, as we've been hearing that people who have been um, uh, bringing goods either solely or mainly from the EU, uh, well, they haven't had to do a lot of these things for the last 30 odd years or so. Um, I, I, and that's why you'll see on my um, uh, on my first slide, what's a deferment account? Uh, because uh, that's a very obvious thing that uh, people who import from the rest of the world uh, know about um, it's it, it's how you um, declare on a on a periodic basis or how you pay rather uh, import duties including uh, import VAT um, and from the first of January that is going to be a requirement. Um, again, I think uh, as has been mentioned very briefly um, whether we get a free trade agreement uh, with the EU or not. Um, we are still going to uh, have to produce goods to customs um, they, uh, for to make basic documents. Um, oh, sorry, to use uh, basic documents to make uh, declarations. Um, in some respects, it's no different to what people should be doing now. It's, there's a commercial invoice um, uh, and a packing list uh, or a. Um, uh, delivery note, uh, which contains sufficient uh, details of the goods, the value, and so on. Um, first issue uh, that uh, people may come across is, is well, actually, I, I've got two values. I, I, I sell it, uh, I sell the goods to somebody, say, in the UK, um, and they sell it on to the final customer. Uh, but that's been um, um, uh, that, that's that second sale, the final sale. Has been made already. So can I use, but can I use the um, um, the the lower value 
uh, on which uh, customs duty will be um, calculated? And normally the answer is, well, no, um, it, it's the, the, the value uh, of the goods uh, uh, at um, uh, when they hit the frontier. Um, that will be used to um, um, uh, to calculate customs duty. So there is a and the um, the incidence of people having two of these values uh, floating around their supply chain is actually quite a uh, potentially a diff difficult one. Um, Another one that's uh, another difficulty is that um, somebody has to be there on a customs entry. There are three three boxes normally: the consignee, um, sorry, the consignor. Um, in this instance, it may be in the EU. Consignee, uh, the customer in the uh, in the UK, and the declarant. And the declarant takes the responsibility um, for actually making sure that the customs declarant uh, de declaration is correct and it's accurate. Um, What's causing a, quite a bit of uh, concern um, uh, with some of our clients is that um, they, um, um, the declarant uh, is jointly and severally liable with the consignee uh, for any import charges. Uh, that effectively means that if uh, the consignee doesn't have uh, a presence in the UK, uh, that they will look to the declarant the settlement of any um, uh, customs charges that go, go awry. Um, so uh, people are, there are uh, several companies, uh, if not quite, quite a lot, who are actually offering this service. Um, but other people say, well, you know, it's an open-ended li um, 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 liability and, and people really should you be taking that. So um, uh, other companies have set up um, um, subsidiary companies or branch offices in the UK, and that will be a problem that doesn't arise. But other people don't want to do that. So, so that's something that you know people have got to consider uh, upfront. Um, another one which uh, we've uh, we've again we've heard about is uh, tariff classification. Um, one of the um, um, problems there is that uh, the, the tariff classification is the basis of, of, of um, customs valuation, origin, and many other aspects. Um, the main thing about it is that uh, for some people, it's very straightforward. It's not, it's not a problem. Uh, if you've got something like fresh fruit and vegetables, uh, the classification of those, which uh, enables the identification of any uh, import charges that have to be levied, um, it's pretty straightforward, but for others, uh, it's not at all. Uh, I recently did a classification exercise for one event, um, which involved about 2,000 items needing to be um, cl classified and um, uh, assigned the, you know, the proper description for customs purposes. So it can be actually quite onerous. Um, origin, we heard um, a lot of comments a few months ago with, where the car industry said, well, hang on, what happens if, um, you know, even if we get a, a, a preferential origin agreement with the EU, our cars won't, um, made in the UK, won't qualify. So, um, you know, we go on from there, um, but a very, uh, um, and, and some people might have to substitute, uh, say, in this instance, UK made products um for what was originally either from the rest of the world or, or from the eu so that the uh, the relevant um origin criteria can be met but the problem is at the moment we don't know what those criteria are um but uh, another potential um, um uh, difficulty is that people will uh, say well we get ours uh, our material from germany or spain uh but in fact as it will turn out that well, yeah, but they've outsourced those from Asia or China, uh, and, and um, you know they just don't qualify for a declaration of EU origin, uh, and so that can cause uh, great difficulties. Um, and, you know, one of my one of one of my war stories that I spent some time swanning around in America, 
um, trying to establish where goods had come from when in fact they they come from Asia um, and, and that had caused uh, import licensing problems uh, in the UK. Um, some of the uh, the helpful uh, news is that uh, there are customs facilitation procedures. Um, as you'll see, warehouse uh, warehousing in processing temporary import, which means that if you have got a uh, liability for duty, um, then you can either defer it um, until it's used, helping cash cash flow, uh, or if it's coming in for inward processing and then has to be re-exported, um, then then you can suspend duty entirely. Um, you know that can be quite complex if you've got things like uh, substitution or um, rates of yield to work out, but sometimes it can be very, very straightforward. Um, I think we've had a few comments on brokerage resources and inco terms, so I won't say anything about those. And again, we've had some comment about uh, you know the regu regulatory authorities, uh, how will they react? Uh, I do a lot of dispute work and you know it can be quite um, depressing uh, the attitude of the border force if they perceive that problems have occurred, um, particularly if you're in the one of the special regimes like alcohol and tobacco, and um, uh, they say that there'll be a light touch. Um, well, that's we'll we'll see, but uh, you know dealing with seizures uh, by the border forces is, is really a very unpleasant experience. Um, Northern Ireland. That may cause uh, many problems on their own. I don't think there's any point in going through that at the moment because things have changed recently. So we'll have to see how that um, uh, plays out. Um, opportunities, just in time changes. People are saying, oh, just in time, you know, that's immovable. Well, not necessarily. Um, you know, um, I can remember studying uh, the Dell um, computer. Um, um, uh, oper uh, uh, assembly operation and, and effectively um, all the suppliers simply bought uh, generated storage facilities and assembly um, uh, operations just round the actual main Dell building or the main Dell, Dell, Dell center. So things can change, people will adapt um, and um, you know things should um, in time uh, we hope that they will settle down, uh, but again, people will have to be prepared to be uh, flexible. Um, and um, you know, I don't think it's going to be all in the end, all doom and gloom. So uh, that's mine. Thank you very much, and um, I'd like to hand you back to um, Tony. That's great. Um, thanks, Jordan. So, ladies and gentlemen, almost there. Um, I'll just take over the slides and we'll quickly run forward. Um, so, yeah, lots and lots to think about and very little time. Um, yeah, so um, we've got some pre uh, submitted questions. Uh, and the first one, um, Bob, Bob Sanguinetti, are, are, you, are you still there? I am indeed. Ah, oh, fantastic. Well, thanks for sticking around, Bob. Uh, and thanks, thanks again for your uh, fantastic talk earlier on. Um, Bob, uh, the question is, are your members satisfied that the IT systems for import and export are robust enough and are going to stand up on the, the 1st of January? Um, well, we, we, we haven't seen the uh, fullness of the IT systems and as as Richard said earlier on, that uh, uh, it's not going uh, the, the the system that connects importers, exporters, um, the goods, the vehicles, um, customs on both sides isn't going live for another two weeks yet. So um, uh, uh, there'll be a leap of faith. Um, so 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 what I would say is because in order to keep um, uh, things smooth, running smoothly uh, at uh, at the borders. Um, this system needs to be in place. It clearly will not be working at 100% efficiency with everyone uh, signed up to it. So uh, we'd be calling for uh, for pragmatism um, and, and leniency in the early days. And I know that that will come from from the UK side because uh, the, the UK government is adopting a phased approach. Uh, we need to see that. 
uh, being mirrored uh, on the other side, um, on the EU side. Uh, but I think to 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 think that there won't be uh, friction or added friction or delays uh, on the first of January uh, would be uh, somewhat naive. Uh, and we have to work collaboratively, collaboratively, um, apply pragmatism, and try and work through the issues. Great. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, this is possibly a little bit unfair, um, but to you again, Bob. Um, if if there's one thing that happens on the 1st of January, you know, the one one thing that you'll be looking out for, what would it be? So what's going to be our best sort of weather vein for uh, uh, how, how things are going to go? I think trying to get everyone in the supply chain from right from the start to the end um, bought into the new systems and the new processes. Um, and it will not happen um, on the flick of a switch. It'll take time. Uh, but I think uh, those who fall foul of uh, any disruption early on will soon learn their lessons and make sure that they're ready uh, the second time round. Because uh, at the end of the day, it's in everyone's interest uh, for that trade to flow freely uh, across uh, across the channel. OK, so, so sorry then. So, I mean, we've just been through a transition period or we're still we're coming to the end of the transition period. But what you're talking about is a further transition period while, whilst we bed these these new systems in. Is that, is that a fair well, summary? Well, I, I, I think you're putting the words into my mouth. Um, but I am. I apologize. An, extent, an extension to the transition uh, <laughs> is, uh, in effect, uh, I, I think what is uh, what, what is needed uh, because uh, we haven't yet got the systems in place. Uh, we haven't yet got everyone trained up to use those systems. Uh, investment has been slow for good reason because we've been otherwise distracted with the realities of uh, of COVID-19 and so on. Uh, we haven't known, we still don't know the practical detail of the final deal, if there is a deal which will impact on what those uh, what those processes, what those, what those checks will look like. Uh, so uh, it's inevitable that you can't just flick a switch and expect to go from one regime today to a new one uh, overnight. So, so I, I think I wouldn't call it an extension to a tra to the transition phase. I'd call it an implementation period because I'd like to think that by the 31st of December, we'll have a bit more clarity on the framework within which we are um, dealing uh, and trading with the EU. Fantastic. No, I, I think that's what I, I was driving at. But, but thank you for your for your sort of clarification, which is much more valuable than me putting words in your mouth. Um, uh, the next question is for Richard Ballantyne. Um, Richard, are you are you still there? I know Richard was talking to the BBC earlier on. I hope he's been able to come back. Yes, Tony, I'm here. Oh, fantastic. Um, Richard, um, similar sort of question to you then. Are your members satisfied that the physical infrastructure to manage the import and export uh, are ready for one one twenty one, and will they be ready for first of July? Yes, I think it's a very good point and a, and a good question. And I, I can't be drawn, unfortunately, Tony. You probably do your best in the, a, a trained legal profession to to draw me out to say this, but I can't say exactly where it won't be ready because I think that would be unfair. But I think it, it probably is fair to say that not all the infrastructure will be ready in time in which case government is going to have to decide whether it's going to be pragmatic or whether it's going to be strict and enforce these controls. As you rightly say, though, we've got a bit of time until July initially, but I, I would echo Bob's very valid point about some kind of, we'd have to think of a new branded term for it because we've had implementation, transition and all those things over the last four years where people have done that. But if we can get the the um, the, the comms uh, strategists at the government to come up with a, a new term, I think that would be a probably uh, a kind of request from a lot of freight operators, as well as generally a pragmatic approach to enforcement of these controls to enable operators to get used to the new systems and let things bed in properly so that we're not effectively stopping things immediately just for the sake of stopping them. But of course, our control over that is only half the story, isn't it? Because, because you know, the, the, the export cargoes, we, we don't have control over those processes. Absolutely. Um, you're absolutely right as ever, Tony. Uh, what we're looking at is potentially to see how these systems and controls work at the other end of certain routes, of course, and, and you know, waiting to see whether ferries are delayed somewhat or whether there is um, any problems either at their end or falling back on our end. But just coming back to your original question, I think one point I should make is that, of course, not all ports are roll on roll off ports. 
And a lot of them have experience of big container terminals, of bulk handling facilities. They do have experience of handling goods under customs control, and they do know what to do. A lot of them plug directly into the HMRC systems or they have uh, CSP provision. So it's not all doom and gloom. There are definitely ports that are on top of this and ready and raring to go. And if we do see increases of traffic from outside the EU with new trade deals, you know, that, that's the aspiration at least. Effectively, there's a lot of ports across the UK in different parts of the UK who are well placed to uh, receive that. OK, well, thanks. Thanks for that sort of positive um, uh, end there, Richard. Um, and same question I put to Bob. If, if there's one thing you're going to look for on the, on the 1st of January, just as a, an indicator of, of how things are going, what would it be? You're still thinking, Richard. You're, you're on mute. Apologies, I thought that was direct, very naughty. I thought I was directed to Bob. Apologies, yes. Um, no, I beg your pardon. If, if there was one thing uh, we'd need, I think it, it probably comes, does come down to the pragmatic approach, etc. And there's lots of different potential requests. So you could see operators on the Irish Sea in Northern Ireland um, who want to see things pragmatically implemented. You could see others who have a lot of animal and plant based products needing uh, border control post infrastructure that is uh, ready and raring to go, etc. So I think it depends where you are. But broadly speaking, uh, without kind of um, repeating myself too much, I think a pragmatic enforcement of the new control regimes is what uh, would unify most of the ports together. OK, well, that, that, that's fantastic. Thank, thank you very much, Richard. Um, there's one last question. I've got a few questions here, but what I suggest is, is this one's a little bit off piste and I think it's, um, it hasn't been touched on at all during the day. Um, so one last question and this, uh, I, I think this should go to my colleague uh, Beth Bradley and it, it, it's very legal. So apologies for that. Um, for those of you who have no interest in things legal. Um, the question is this, Beth, are you there? I am. Hi, Tony. Hi. Um, are there likely to be significant changes following the 1st of January 2021 to litigation or arbitration procedure, both at the outset of a dispute and also following obtaining an award or judgment from an enforcement perspective? Oh, thank you, Tony. Sorry. Um, the shortest of short answers is yes. Um, and and it's the, the, the it's a the ends of or the part of litigation, which is desperately depressing because uh, it's not really getting into the meat of the procedure. It is, it's instead faffing about with the procedural issues uh, which are pertinent either to commencement or, or to enforcement. Um, it, it, commencement of procedure, uh, proceedings are getting them served elsewhere in the, the EU on departure. Um, or, or at the end of the transition period is likely to become a lot more complicated. I won't go through the various conventions which we are now um, going to come out of, um, but there, it, it will become a lot more complicated. There will be, we'll be back to um, uh, potentially a lot of jurisdiction disputes at the beginning of proceedings um, and potentially a rise in anti-suit uh, proceedings. So where uh, you have a contract that specifies the seat of the dispute as being in the UK, but your counterparty uh, is situated in, in, in a European member state. Um, uh, if they commence against you uh, in, in, in their home state, uh, you might have to obtain a, a, an injunction to prevent the claim proceeding there and drag it back to the UK. Um, they've not been much of a feature uh, in, in kind of past few decades between uh, the UK and, and other member states because we've all been part of one political and trading bloc. Um, similarly, at the other end, so at the enforcement stage where you've obtained your shiny judgment in your favour or arbitration award in your favour, um, uh, the position at the moment is particularly for court judgments, uh, anything uh, which has or already been commenced, um, there is reciprocal treaties in place so that it can be easily taken and uh, your judgment from the UK court can be taken and enforced in another European state. Um, the position will change following the 1st of January 2021. Um, if you've already commenced your proceedings before that date, everything will stay the same. Um, but if you commence after that date, so you issue your claim, 
um, after the 1st of January, then a completely new regime will be in place uh, for the purposes of enforcement. So, and it will be up to each individual member state um, of the EU to, EU to decide how to treat a judgment issued by the UK court. So it won't be a straightforward process any longer of taking it to, to, to that other country and saying, we've got this judgment, please recognise it. Instead, there may be additional hoops to go through and an additional court process, frankly. Um, things are a bit sunnier with arbitration uh, in the sense that the New York Convention will still apply. It's nothing to do with the EU. So an arbitration award uh, given uh, by one of the London arbitrators will still be enforceable under the New York Convention um, throughout the EU. So no change there. Fantastic. Well, if I have any questions, I know where I'll be coming. Thanks very much. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> um, well, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we've uh, we've overrun slightly um, for half an hour, but I hope um, those of you who've stuck with us have uh, got some value out of this afternoon. Um, just some sort of wash up points. Um, Right, it's, it's clear that uh, the potential for problems is there. Um, congested container ports, French border police, labour shortages, uh, to name but a few of the issues going forward. Uh, the problems are being addressed and dealt with, and the Northern Ireland Protocol is an example of that. The GVMS website went live yesterday. Um, I'm not sure how functional it is, but uh, it, it's, it's progress. It remains to be seen whether that's enough to head off delay some of the problems do seem intractable um, but what we can do uh, now mitigates the problem going forward so if we can get to grips with the new system what we were talking about with with bob and with richard which is the uh, i think i think the expression was the implementation um, period um, might actually um, be a, a fruitful and uh, uh, period for for us um, we may not be ready for the 1st of January, but uh, we may alleviate the problems. We may be ready for the 1st of July. Um, all that remains then is for me to thank our guest speakers, uh, Richard Burnett uh, earlier, but above all, um, I think greater thanks goes to, to Bob Sanguinetti and Richard Ballantyne because they stuck with us all afternoon, and particularly Bob, uh, who, who kicked us off uh, so well and um, has, has been around to the bitter end. So to both of you, thank many, many, many thanks. And good luck in your endeavours with government uh, in the coming weeks. So thank you very much, everybody. I'll say goodbye and um, happy Christmas to all of you. Thank you. Bye-bye.